Welcome to the 31st meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask you all please to ensure that your mobile phones are on silent? I'd like to, no apologies have been received, so I'd like to move straight on to agenda item one, which is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking item four in private to review the evidence it has heard on the Islands Bill. Are the members agreed? Yes. That is agreed then. We'll move straight on to agenda item two. This is the final evidence session on the Island Scotland Bill. I'd like to welcome Liam MacArthur, uh, who is joining the committee for this part of the evidence session. I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Hamza Youssef, the Minister of Transport and the Islands, Ian Turner, the Island Bill team, Darren Dixon, also from the Island Bill team, and Heike Garden, the solicitor on behalf of the uh, Government. Minister, would you like to make a brief opening statement? Please, uh, thank you very much and good morning to the committee. I'd like to thank, of course, <clears throat> the committee for the opportunity to speak to the Islands Bill at stage one today. I'm, of course, happy to answer your questions uh, about the Bill's measures. This is the Parliament's first ever Islands Bill, and I'm extremely proud to be leading the Bill process. I therefore welcome the close and very careful scrutiny that you have given to stage one, uh, engaging with the communities themselves, as well as hearing the views of a wide range of stakeholders. I've been listening to and considering carefully all of the evidence presented. I'm encouraged to hear witnesses' general agreement with the broad direction of the Bill and its measures. I appreciate the consensual and very thoughtful approach which committee members have taken to date and hope that will continue as the Bill progresses through the Parliament. At its very heart, the Bill seeks to improve the outcomes for our island communities. Our islands make a significant and unique contribution to Scotland's culture, to its heritage, to economy, and of course to society as a whole. So our aim is to create the right statutory environment to underpin the economic and social well-being of our islands, to enable sustainable economic growth and empower uh, their communities. Uh, working with island communities and other partners, we are, of course, already addressing many of the challenges that our islands face. This is evident from a wide range of policy initiatives, including ferry services, affordable transport, air travel, housing, digital connectivity, uh, economic development, infrastructure, and indeed, of course, the Gaelic language. This bill seeks to amplify this work and ensure there's a sustained focus by all key parties, including, of course, essentially government, to meet the needs of island communities and create the right conditions for growth. Uh, I briefly want to highlight some of the bill's key measures. The proposal to develop a national islands plan sits at the very heart of the bill. The plan will set out an agreed strategic direction of government and the wider public sector to adopt and implement in the future. Uh, my initial thinking has been to create the space and opportunity for island communities themselves and indeed, of course, other relevant stakeholders to be involved collaboratively in contributing to the content of the plan. The duty to consult in the bill is a serious and meaningful one. So putting more provision relating to the plan in the face of the bill at this stage before that consultation is undertaken uh, seems uh, somewhat to precipitate uh, that. But I can understand why committee members and others might want, to provide, might want us to provide more content uh, around the plan, and of course I'm happy to consider that uh, and discuss that. Island proofing, of course, is another key element uh, of the bill. I want all areas of government and indeed the public sector to be required and expected to consider the specific needs of islands in relevant policy and decision making. I'm determined to ensure that island proofing is approached seriously and undertaken meaningfully. Uh, to do so, of course, requires an element of flexibility. Many island communities share common challenges, but not always at the same time or indeed with the same priority. There are, of course, issues which are specific to some and uh, not to others. Public sector bodies also clearly have a wide range of functions, roles and responsibilities. To be overly prescriptive, on how island proofing should be undertaken on the face of the bill could undermine its effectiveness in the future, something all of us uh, wish to avoid. So while I, I'm, of course, open to discussion on this, and I will be, uh, I'm keen that we get the balance right with the sufficiency of direction in the bill provisions uh, that also allow for appropriate autonomy and space, indeed, for innovation uh, by public bodies and how they involve and work with island communities, uh, with the practical detail on how they achieve this uh, on, uh, in statutory guidance. <coughs> Excuse me. The protection of the Scottish parliamentary boundary for the Western Isles uh, has been welcome, as has the flex flexibility to create one or two member wards for islands, although I acknowledge some may want the bill 
to go further. The marine licensing provisions are generally seen as positive, creating a step-by-step -step process for any new licensing regime. This recognises the opportunities, uh, but also the risks as we need to integrate any new regime into the current marine planning and licensing landscape. Uh, just to conclude, uh, convener, I consider the measures in this island's bill will provide the right statutory framework and underpinning to enable our shared ambition for Scotland's islands to be realised. And while I hope the committee can support the general principles of the bill, of course I remain open to suggestions which will improve the bill and improve ultimately the outcomes for our island communities. Thank you, convener. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the first question is going to come from John Finney. Good morning, Minister. You, you've touched on this in your opening remarks, but if you could perhaps just humour me and uh, uh, reaffirm your, your position on it. And that is you know, a brief summary of the overall intent of the Bill, Minister. And perhaps if you could outline whether you see any merit in having high-level objectives appear on the face of the Bill. I, mean, I think... Uh that high-level uh, objective, hopefully, I, I mentioned at the start and, and at the end, uh, which is you know, to create a sustained focus for government uh, and, indeed, for public uh, bodies uh, to place island communities uh, at the centre uh, of, of, of their uh, focus uh, and also to improve the outcomes for island uh, communities. So, for me, that would be the success uh, of, of the bill. Um, but clearly, uh, on top of that, um, you know, maybe the high level uh, outcome is eventually having a national islands plan, which I think having travelled to a number of islands uh, now across Scotland, there's a real uh, tangible interest uh, in what the national islands plan as a result of, of the bill uh, will be able uh, to deliver. So I think that's a clear statement that the main, uh, the main purpose of this is to create a sustained focus of island communities, but to better improve the outcome of island communities right across Scotland. That would be the high level. Now, your second part of your question was, would that be beneficial to have on, on, on the face uh, of the bill? Um, you know, as so long as we're not restricting uh, ourselves um, in any way, then of course I'm always open-minded to these things. Perhaps guidance again would be the better place uh, for that uh, to be earned in policy memorandums. Uh, but uh, yes, that is the high level objective, create that sustained focus for government of island communities, but also to improve the outcome uh, for island communities. Okay, thank you very much. The next question then is Rhoda. Uh, um, if I could just push you a little bit more on that, because when we were taking evidence, people were telling us that the thing they really wanted to see as an outcome of the bill was population growth and economic development, which um, they felt was lacking. So rather than the bill just being a focus, they wanted to see a tangible difference made by the bill. And I wondered if you would consider things like that on the face of the bill as aims that would be f foremost in people's minds as they were island proofing and the like. Uh, I think the member makes a good point. She's absolutely right. I've travelled now to over 30 islands uh, across Scotland and touched on each of the local authority areas um, that, that, that uh, have islands, inhabited islands, I should say, uh, in the local authority area. And uh, depopulation is probably uh, right at the top of, of the list on how to overcome uh, depopulation. Some islands are doing it uh, well. Uh, most islands, of course, are struggling with this issue. And uh, the reason why I would be wary of being prescriptive and putting it on the face of the bill is I don't want to necessarily exclude certain items that should be discussed. Um, because, And that's why I think the National Islands Plan will be important. Um, again, I don't, wouldn't want to be prescriptive about it, but certainly the National Islands Plan would have to, uh, to be anything meaningful, would have to look at issues such as depopulation, which of course is linked to health, housing, economic opportunity, jobs, education, and so on and so forth, digital connectivity, transport, of course. So uh, while uh, all these things you and I would understand would have to be somewhat... Uh, uh, it would have to be in some kind of islands plan in some way, shape or form, because otherwise the document wouldn't be meaningful. To put it on the face of the bill, um, or to be prescriptive about it, I'd be wary of. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to be close-minded to it entirely, I'd take committee's view on it, but I wouldn't want to be so prescriptive that for future governments, I'm sure we'll talk about timescales and so on and so forth, but for future governments to tie them into these issues, um, I think maybe it might be counterproductive. But again, I'm open-minded. Can, can I then maybe turn it on its head a wee bit and say, what would success look like to you? What would, the, if the bill was successful, how would you measure that success? What, what, 
mix? Where are the tangible differences that you would see? And I think it's a really good question in that, actually, even before the bill has passed, I'm seeing some evidence of success in the sense that uh, my, my colleagues in the social security team, uh, they've, pub they've already done effectively an island proofing. Uh, now, uh, they've, they've, they've chosen to go down that following largely the, the, the mode of other impact assessment, model of other impact assessments that we have. Uh, but they've already, in the Social Security uh, Bill, they've already looked at uh, island proofing that. So in some element, we've already seen success, even though the bill hasn't passed. Uh, to answer your question more, more directly, uh, of course, the publication eventually of uh, National Islands Plan, that would, for me, uh, would be uh, success. Seeing legislation... Um, and indeed, not just from the government, but also uh, when it comes to, 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 to policies from uh, relevant authorities and public bodies uh, being island-proofed, that to me would be success. Eventually, uh, if local authorities want it, having you know, their own marine licensing um, powers um, and potentially in the future whether they're generating revenue from that, whether that benefits communities in the future, that again to me would be a potential success. Uh, of the bill as well. Um, and again, if local authorities want to, if the Boundary Commission, for example, comes forward with ideas for one or two member wards uh, and they're accepted by uh, ministers and, and so on and so forth and passed um, uh, through the process, then again, that would be success of the bill. So the success of the bill can take many, many forms. Um, I think uh, some of that will rest on, uh, undoubtedly, some of the work we take forward as a result of this bill, such as the National Islands Plan. Thank you. Um, Jamie, uh, I'll bring you in briefly, and then I want to come to the Deputy Convener. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, it's actually, uh, to follow on from Rhoda Grant's point, um, I, I do uh, take on board what you're saying about being too prescriptive around some of the elements which you expect to be in the plan and not putting them in the bill, and I think we'll come on to discuss that. But it is true to say that uh, much of the feedback we got was around the absence of a high-level mission statement around the bill. Now, you say a successful outcome would be the islands plan, but you also used the phrase that you would expect the bill to ensure there's a sustained focus on islands uh, by government and there would be improved outcomes for islands. You, you've said that to committee. Is there any reason why you couldn't put that in the bill? I don't think, uh, legally, look at colleagues here, but I don't think there's any reason why uh, we couldn't. Um, again, I would look to, to my colleagues in terms of if that's the usual practice uh, for uh, bills uh, or not, or legislation or not. I have to say I'm not fundamentally opposed to it. I just don't know whether it's uh, usual practice uh, or, or, or not. But uh, if the committee felt really strongly about uh, putting a, a mission statement uh, on, on the face of the bill, uh, then, of course, I'm sure we could consider that. Thank you. I'm going to move to uh, Gail Ross, the Deputy Convener, to, for the next question. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, quite a few of the witnesses that we spoke to um, raised concerns that remote and rural areas on the mainland also face a lot of the same issues that the islands do. And uh, it was highlighted that care would have to be taken not to disadvantage these communities. So can you tell us what the Scottish Government intends to do to understand and, and mitigate for any impacts that the bill might have on remote and rural communities on the mainland? Mm. Can I say I also saw that come out strongly from the evidence sessions that you took in <clears throat> many of the areas that you travelled to, uh, but I thought also uh, it's, a, it's an issue that's been raised with me when I have the, the strategic group for the local authorities. You'll know that I expanded that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, initially, from the three Holy Island communities uh, to the other three that are uh, local authorities that have islands, and um, uh, Margaret Davidson from from the Highland Council uh, was one to to make that very point very robustly in a number of, of meetings uh, that I had. So it's not a point that's lost on me by any stretch of the imagination. It's also one that I have. Uh, a great deal of sympathy with as well. I think there's a, a very good argument to be made around some areas of, of, of peripherality on the mainland uh, that face many of the same challenges uh, that island communities may well face. I suppose there's a couple of things uh, that I would say in that respect. Uh, one is, is obviously clear sustained action the government has taken in terms of uh, rural Scotland. I won't go into all of that, but whether that's a rural poverty task force, whether that's a rural parliament, uh, that sat, whether it's um, the Rural Housing uh, Fund, uh, Rural and Island Tourism Infrastructure Fund, which uh, also, of course, affects rural Scotland as much as it does island uh, tourism uh, as well. So there's a number of actions, initiatives, again, which I can't list all of, that we've has a, have a sustained focus on the rural uh, economy. What I would also say is that rural communities should look at island proofing uh, as a great opportunity. 
and that uh, if island proofing, as I hope it will, passes as part of this bill, is successful in its implementation, as I hope and imagine it would be, there's no reason why at all the government, and I've already had co uh, conversations with my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, that there's no reason why, of course, uh, we shouldn't look at that in government and say if it's working well for islands, is this something we want to explore for rural Scotland as well? Now, I can't give a commitment to, to, to that because we'd have to look at see how it how it pans out. Uh, but certainly I've got sympathy for the general uh, argument from uh, certain areas of, of rural Scotland and I think it's something we have to be cognisant for. What I would say is it's obviously not for an islands bill. This is specific to those island communities. Um, thank you. No, bearing in mind that it is an islands bill, absolutely. Um, Liam MacArthur and I had conversations with a bus company that made a decision on the mainland that then affected islands with the ferries and the connections and stuff. How do we mitigate against decisions that are made on the mainland that might affect island communities? It's tricky in, on the bus side. I know, I know which um, service you're, you're talking about. Cause, uh, I think either one or at least both of you have perhaps uh, raised it with me. That um, when it comes to, to, to private companies, it's a little bit more difficult. But what I would say uh, is for, if you look at the schedule of uh, relevant authorities, those public sector bodies, it's quite a, a long list. And officials can correct me, but around about 60 odd um, organisations on that list do have a, have a real um, impact on uh, island communities, but also some of them stretch on to mainland. Uh, they're, 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 um, re the remit covers mainland communities as well. So they would have a duty to also island proof um, uh, as well. So that's one way of mitigating uh, against those effects. I, I, I take your point though, uh, around the example that you used around um, bus services, uh, more difficult to do when there's a commercial operator involved. Um, Minister, I mean, one of the points that was brought up on one of the visits that we went to, that Transport Scotland isn't mentioned per se on the list of uh, consultees on the back of the uh, bill. Um, what? It would be included. I mean, it comes under, I mean, any... Yeah, it comes, comes under, under a government, but they're, they're not specifically mentioned. Did you, I mean, it'd be helpful just to have reassurance that, that, that you feel they're adequately covered before I move on to the next question. Uh, yes, because they come under Scottish Government, so they, they would be absolutely covered. But, uh, again, if there's a reason to specifically mention them, uh, uh, if that gives comfort to the committee, I'm sure we could, but they would come under, under Scottish Government, most certainly. Thank okay. you. John, your, your uh, next question. Thanks, Convener. Um, yeah, really continuing with the Islands Plan, I mean, everybody we met thinks there should be an Islands Plan, so that's a good starting point. However, I think people's imagination of it is varied so much because there's nothing in the bill about it. And so, for example, one of the issues that has been raised is, would the islands plan purely make statements about all the islands? Or would it uh, actually mention, say, the Western Isles, and so that there's a bit in the islands plan about the Western Isles? Or would it go even further down and mention, say, Barra, an individual island, and say something about Barra? Or do we, are we just doing the national stuff in the islands plan and then it would be up to the Western Isles Council to then have their own plan, which I think some of the islands already have, a, a plan for their group of islands and for individual islands. Can, can you give us anything about how that all fits together? Sure, I had a good discussion on the national islands plan uh, at the last strategic islands group meeting uh, that I held. It was in July, uh, I think when we last had that meeting. And I took my cue and some guidance from the local authorities represented around the table. And uh, I think you may have heard this at your own evidence session, in fact, that uh, some of them pointed towards the National Gaelic Plan uh, that we have uh, as a good example. Uh, and if you look at that, of course, it's a fairly high level uh, document, and I think the National Islands Plan uh, should also be high level in its nature. I wouldn't envisage going right down to local uh, islands. There may be parts of the National Island Plan which refer to certain geographies. I think that would be uh, almost, uh, I'm sure, inevitable. But uh, I wouldn't expect us to, to, to get uh, a focused geographic approach in that sense, but either deal with um, deal with the high level. That being said, there would be nothing stopping local authorities to develop their own plans on the back of that. It's not an instruction as part of the National Islands Plan unless we chose to make it, uh, which again would be would be in collaboration with the, the, the committee, the parliament and, and other stakeholders. But uh, most certainly it would be uh, more high level, so where we could seek to, to focus resource where necessary, um, provide targets for key areas of activity 
some of which we've already uh, talked to. Uh, but also have to work alongside other local and national plans, uh, some of which I've already uh, mentioned, but um, marine, uh, National Marine Plan, for example, local outcome uh, improvement plans. But there would be nothing stopping, as I say, local authorities developing their own individual islands plans on the, on the back of taking the steer and direction of the National uh, Islands Plan because you're looking at a kind of higher level, which is, is fair enough. I mean, the particular subjects that would be in the island's plan, I mean, subjects that have been suggested to us would include population transport, <coughs> housing, health, digital connectivity. Would these be the kind of things that would be in the plan? Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, mean, you know, I think when you travel to... Uh, you know, I, I purposely make a point of trying to get to as many islands, big and small, so trying to get to, you know, I've been to islands of a population of 30 or less, uh, right the way through to our larger islands, and, and I try to try to hear from the islands and, and the communities directly about what's concerning them. And there are some very, very common themes, and you've touched on some of them, in fact, you've touched on, on a lot of them uh, already, but there are particular issues of priority to particular uh, con constituencies and constituencies, particularly islands, I should say, and I could give many examples of that, but I won't, but I can give many examples of islands where there's one issue uh, on one uh, island, but on the neighbouring island, um, that, is, that same issue is not quite as high a priority. So that's why I'm saying um, it may well be more sensible to, to have a national overarching islands plan, uh, but then for local authorities to maybe perhaps delve uh, into the issues that are important to their island communities, where they can do that, bearing in mind, of course, uh, many local authorities have a number of islands, and as I've already alluded to, uh, neighbouring ones can have very different priorities indeed. Okay, and the final point I wanted to raise with you was um, that when it talks about the islands plan in the bill, it talks about improving outcomes for island communities. Now, that suggests that islands with no people would just not appear at all in the islands plan or be covered by it. And we've clearly, well, the obvious case is St Kilda, uh, where you know, it's hugely important from an environmental and historical point of view, but doesn't have a community. So would the islands plan cover the likes of that situation? Yeah, I, I saw the evidence around that, and I have to say, give us um, some food for thought. And uh, St Kilda, again, as you mentioned, being, being the obvious example which you spoke about during your uh, deliberations. And uh, yes, I would say that uh, I wouldn't be close-minded about uh, how to bring in uninhabited islands like St Kilda. I don't think there's many more uninhabited islands <coughs> excuse me, uh, that, that, that uh, would necessarily be in the scope of the National Islands Plan that wouldn't be covered by other pieces of legislation, heritage uh, and, and, and forestry and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, yes, I, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to look at it. Um, I don't think it would be something that we would, uh, that we'd benefit from other parts of the, uh, other parts of the legislation necessarily. Um, but again, if, if committee members felt strongly about it, uh, I wouldn't be uh, close-minded to it. Thank you very much. Minister, uh, one of the evidence sessions or a couple of the evidence sessions that we took when we were on islands, it was clear that, clear that some community groups with on islands had aspirations of coming up with their own plan. What, what it appears you're suggesting is there should be a strategic plan and the islands plans and probably down to community level plans can be fed into that plan and, and respond to your strategic plan. Is that what you're suggesting? It, it, it seems to be a strange way of doing it, is having a strategic plan with islands then building their plans around that strategic plan, rather than have it, communities and islands coming up with their plan, which then develops the strategic plan. Seems to be the wrong way around, but maybe you could just explain that, because sure. I'm sure that's a question will be asked. So, first thing is, when it comes to the National Islands Plan, uh, this will be a fully collaborative and engaging process. In fact, we've already started some of that engagement. So, I mentioned the Island Strategic Group, but the purpose of my visiting 30 islands is not for the sake of going to 30 islands. The purpose is to go in to hear from island communities what it is that they want in the National Islands Plan, and that is come, and indeed uh, what their priorities are, what their needs are. And uh, I have to say, the National Islands Plan has featured in many of the discussions I've had, as I say, on these 30 uh, plus, plus islands uh, that I've visited. So already, uh, and, and if it's helpful for the committee, perhaps, because I'm, I'm getting a sense of, of, of where you're going with this, if it's helpful, perhaps uh, we can think about a timeline 
uh, of how we see the development of the National Islands Plan, the engagement process and the various milestones. I think that probably is something we should, we, we should develop anyway internally, we will develop, but perhaps we could share that also with committee because it will be a very, very collaborative and engaging process. So it will already have that feed in from the bottom up, as you're suggesting, which is the right way around, of course, for any plan, in fact, whether it's our national performance framework or any other plan that we have or strategy document we have in government and I'm conducting also the review of the national transport strategy. Uh, and that is, again, taking that approach from the community bottom up. So we'll have that focus. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that it has to have that high level focus. We have, as we know, 93 inha inhabited islands in, in, in Scotland, um, you know, to, to, to create, a, you know, to get into every single nook and cranny and discuss every single uh, nuanced issue uh, with the detail we'd want to of every single island would be difficult for any national islands plan to do, which I know you'll, you'll, you'll understand. It has to be high level. What, uh, of course, we, we, we would uh, maybe not uh, expect. We leave it to the to the um, uh, to the desire of the, of the local authority, but uh, and the wishes of local communities. But we could feasibly see local authorities and communities creating their own local plans based on the direction of the national plan, which has already been fed in by them. So it's circular in one sense. I, I think the roadmap and and the plan and the route to get to the national plan would, would certainly be helpful to some of the community groups that we've spoken to. I'm going to bring Fulton McGregor in there, please. Dinner, hey, morning, Minister. Um, I, I suppose it's actually just uh, picking up a wee bit from uh, John uh, Mason's uh, point <coughs> earlier, and also the conveners there. But I, I suppose it's trying to, um, I suppose, asking yourself what, what your own. Uh, what you, you, what you see as the priority areas, and I know that you've kind of reflected already on that and said that each uh, island's individual, and that's certainly what we got when uh, we've been out on the islands as well, but uh, have you got a sense of what, what you think might be general uh, overall priority areas uh, you know, going forward? Um, in terms of the islands plan, uh, if so, yeah. I mean, if so, uh, I would put, as, as Rhoda Grant uh, had already mentioned, you know, depopulation as being one of the the key key challenges, and uh, anybody again who's spoken to island communities uh, and others would know that uh, depopulation. Th there's not one kind of silver bullet to tackle that uh, issue. Um, it's related to job opportunities, affordable housing, educational opportunities, um, uh, and, and 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 so on and so forth. Health, of course, uh, as well. Transport links, digital connectivity. So these are the kind of key six or seven themes that keep coming up, regardless of the size of islands, from the small to the to large. And some of the islands have done well in, in, in finding very unique solutions uh, to these. Uh, I think of uh, the island of Egg and, and, and Hebnet and um, the, the, uh, the, the solution that they've managed to come up with in regards to, to digital connectivity. Um, you know, I know many other islands, uh, when it comes to affordable housing, um, how three or four units of housing, I think Iona, uh, four or five you know, units of housing have made a real, real difference. Uh, to, to that island. I know some educational, um, also uh, some, what a difference, um, some unique and innovative approaches to education uh, that have been taken by some islands have made a big, big uh, difference uh, as well. So um, I think those are the key kind of six, seven um, issues that keep coming up. Uh, again, I wouldn't want to be prescriptive because I think uh, as we engage in the, the consultation and, and engagement uh, on the on the National Islands Plan, there'll be many, many other issues the island communities want us to focus on. And, uh, you have mentioned a couple of times that there's some good examples on uh, various islands. Do you think that the Islands Plan will be able to act as um, some sort of framework that, that would maybe help other islands learn, you know, learn from uh, good practice? Uh, I already know, I have to say, that islands are very good at um, speaking to other island communities. And, um, you know, there must be credit to, to the campaign, Our Islands Our Future, which is led by Shetland, Orkney and, and the Western Isles uh, Council. Uh, and, and I think they showed that through collaboration, um, shared learning can mean that uh, each of them uh, get, a, get a bigger slice of the pie, as it was, that each of them uh, managed to get their priority areas higher up the agenda of certainly government, but also uh, indeed in the public discourse. And they did that by learning good practice from each other. So if you wanted to see a, a model of collaboration, shared practice, you wouldn't have to look much further than Our Islands, Our Future uh, campaign. Now, individual islands themselves, of course, uh, yes, there, there's a lot of shared learning in the National Islands Plan. Uh, could perhaps pick some of those examples uh, out, extract them, uh, and, uh, and hopefully others can learn from them. 
be are you open to the six relevant island authorities being named within the bill as statutory consultees? And just in terms of what we're talking about, the other theme we're talking about around sharing collaborative practice. I mean, I would, I would probably prefer that to keep that in the guidance as, as, as it is in terms of the, the obligation to consult. And uh, they would be obvious um, consultees. Um, I haven't quite uh, got the uh, exact wording right to hand, but uh, certainly they're part of the, they would be part of that, uh, uh, they would be part of the, in terms of the guidance, we say very clearly that we should consult with those that have an interest in, in, in island uh, communities and there's no doubt local authorities would be part of that, as would others uh, as well. And putting that on the face of the bill again, if we start that process of being prescriptive on the face of the bill of who should be consulted, inevitably we end up being non-exhaustive and being too prescriptive and the chances of excluding someone could be fairly high, which is something I wouldn't want to go down. So putting it and keeping it in the guidance is probably the way to go, I think. Green, uh, uh, Jamie. Thank you. It's very relevant to Fulton McGregor's point. Um, on our visit to Mull, uh, the session that I sat in, the feedback was very much that they want islanders themselves to be consulted. Now, obviously, the difficulty there is which group on the island do you consult? Is it councillors, community councils? Is it the local authority? Some felt that the local authority didn't always represent the full variety of views on islands, but very much um, the bill as it stands by uh, the wording in, in, in section uh, part two, section four, just says that such persons as they consider are likely to be affected by the proposals. We did wonder if that could be strengthened to actually specifically state that islanders themselves must be consulted. I think it's difficult because when you say islanders themselves must be consulted, uh, how could you consult thousands and thousands of individual islanders? You can give them the opportunity, you could do an open consultation, but you know, if you if you are so prescriptive uh, and you didn't consult a islander and they complained and objected to the fact that you haven't been as, uh, you haven't lived up to, to the, the letter and the word on the on, on the bill, on the face of the bill, then you could find yourself in, in, in difficulty. I think we were learning from um, other pieces of legislation that we've passed, uh, other guidance that we've passed uh, as well. And, and as you've mentioned, uh, part two, um, part four, subsection one uh, B, uh, sorry, one A, uh, part two, such persons as they consider likely to be affected by proposals contained in the plan. If, if, if the committee feels we can strengthen that, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not close-minded to it. I would just be wary of being too prescriptive on the face of the bill as is not to, um, not to, not to exclude uh, relevant uh, uh, bodies uh, and stakeholders, but also to be mindful of the fact that we don't want to slow down the legislative process, or indeed in this case the, the process of developing a national islands plan, uh, which is a fairly ambitious timescale to, to get it done with. But you know, uh, if there are concerns, I also take Jamie Green's point. It's a very, uh, uh, it's a very salient point that's been made to me in a number of occasions when I've travelled to island communities that um, they often feel um, that, uh, or some island communities feel that uh, the local authority can be just as remote to them as, as Edinburgh maybe, or uh, London maybe, or, or anywhere else. And I think that's something we have to be cognizant. So it's not just about consulting with local authorities to have a good relationship with them, but it has to go much, much deeper than that. So if we can strengthen language in a way that is non-prescriptive, but still gives committee confidence that we're talking about island communities as opposed to maybe just kind of local authorities and so on, then we can reflect on that. Next question is Mike Rumbles. Um, <clears throat> with the uh, impact assessments, um, how do we make sure that they are not simply a tick box exercise? It's a very good question. It's uh, the exact phraseology I've used when I've traveled to island communities uh, up and down the country because I've been very aware and cognizant of that the real fear that island communities have that this is just a tick box exercise. So we're working hard to make sure it's not that tick box exercise. Uh, and to do that, clearly it would have to have meaningful engagement and consultation with island communities at the heart of that. And there's a couple of examples we can look to. I think the quality impact assessment has, I was doing a bit of research into and you know there's a fair level number of stages five stages that the quality impact assessment would go through and one of those stages of course is the evidence gathering is the involvement and consultation with other communities I think we'd look to do that uh, as well when it came to island impact assessments too we'd look to engage to consult 
Um, and the bill, of course, provides for statutory guidance, which will contain the practical details of how the process will work. I think, again, just on the theme of being too prescriptive, we we'll try to leave it a little bit more open for public authorities and for relevant authorities and public sector bodies, um, because, again, they're of different size, sizes, different scale, different amounts of resource. So we wouldn't want to be too prescriptive in that sense. But in order to avoid it being a tick box exercise, uh, as, you, as you describe it, uh, consultation has to be a, a key and meaningful part of any island impact assessment. If I, if I can turn the focus the other way around, if you, if you see what I mean. I mean, you've mentioned 60, you've got in the uh, bill 66 public bodies. Um, and the requirement is, is to have this impact assessment. But how will the islanders and island communities be made aware of the performance of these public bodies when they are island proofing? I mean, we can't expect people just to read the annual report, for instance, of these 66 bodies. I'm actually more interested in the actual process of how, how do the communities on the islands will feel satisfied that the 66 bodies are doing it properly, if I can put it that way. Sure. So to avoid them reading 66 reports, I think it's a very sensible question, fair question to, to, to ask. We'll be producing an annual progress report on the National Islands Plan and within that, it will have the progress of how those bodies are doing. So they won't have to read all 66 reports. They can look at how the progress is on every uh, on the annual progress report of the National Islands Plan. Of course, if they had a particular interest in a particular public body, they could just go to that public body and, and there'll be transparency and they can look into more detail. But certainly every time we publish that annual progress report, there's already uh, we've already committed to um, progress on how island proofing uh, is being taken forward by each of those uh, bodies that he mentions. So you, you will want to make sure, therefore, that all of those 66 bodies do the island proofing, if you like, or the impact assessments correctly in the way that you want them to do it. Um, so is the guidance that you're going to issue, is it going to be on a statutory basis where you'll say to them, this is what we want to do, or will it be on an advisory basis? Statutory guidance, uh, but I would just uh, always uh, make this point that I made in my previous answer to the member that we don't want to be so prescriptive and exactly how every single public sector body does it because they are of different sizes, different scales. But he's absolutely right that island communities want to have confidence that it's being done. And often decisions that are made by public bodies may well be more relevant than, uh, for example, decisions that are being made nationally and so on and so forth uh, as well. So he's right in that confidence. And we'll have to monitor that very, very closely as well. If there is a, a need to tighten that guidance, Again, it's the committee's view, then, of course, uh, we would be open-minded to that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Peter. Just following on from that, Minister, um, you know, there, there is currently no formal requirement for public bodies to consult when conducting an island impact assessment. Should this be included in the bill, that there is a formal requirement? Yeah. Well, I think no. it would have to be, yeah, I think it would have to be uh, necessary as part of the guidance. Uh, without uh, doubt. Uh, so, again, we can reflect on that. Organisations obviously already have a kind of range of formal uh, and informal mechanisms for engaging and consulting with communities. Um, it's essential that communities are not engaged just at the time that the decision is already made. That, of course, would be, be too late, but genuinely as part of the as, as process as early as possible. So we want to do that, but we want to avoid, obviously, additional unnecessary bureaucratic uh, processes that kind of hamper uh, uh, the legislative uh, process. However, um, again, I would welcome you know thoughts of committee and how we make it clear that consultation with island communities uh, and, and others is an essential part of that process. So, yes, I, I think it would be necessary as part of the guidance. Again, uh, my, my answer to Mike Rumbles is the same answer I would give to, to Mr Chapman, that um, if the committee thought we had to go further, I'm not close-minded to that. Yep. The, and, a, and a completely different uh, issue. There are there are some concerns that, that some of the language used in the bill, uh, as it's drafted, is subjective and not particularly clear. And we've been you, we've seen criticism of the other recent bills, least, uh, you know, wild animals bill, for instance, and the forestry bill. You, we, we discussed yesterday that there is vague language seen in, in, in within the, the bill, and you know, there's no proper expl explanation of what some of the important terms actually mean. Um, do you recognise that criticism and are, are, you, are you aware that that, that might uh, be something that needs to be looked at? If the 
member has um, specific examples or the committee has specific examples, I'll take them away and, and reflect on them. I have to say it's not something that uh, has come up to me directly, um, but if it was something you found in your evidence sessions or indeed in your own committee deliberations, if there were specific examples of that where we could strengthen wording, uh, as I say, I'm not uh, precious about that. We, if we can do that in a way that, again, um, importantly, we get that balance about not being too prescriptive, um, not being inflexible, and not adding to the bureaucratic process. If we can do it in such a way, then then I'm open-minded. Okay. I'd like to bring Liam in now, if I may, please. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Good morning, uh, Minister. Talked earlier, I think Rhoda uh, Grant mentioned it first in relation to um, what island proofing may mean in practice, and, and I appreciate the um, the, the, the limitations, perhaps, or, or the downsides of trying to be overly prescriptive on the face of the bill. But um, I, I think the committee has heard, certainly I've heard, um, uh, many, many examples put forward of the sort of thing that would benefit from uh, island proofing uh, now in relation to, to things that just don't seem to fit island circumstances. What consideration is the government given um, alongside the, the, the scrutiny of this bill to demonstrating what island proofing would mean by applying it to some of those um, areas, and, and, and we've corresponded on a number of them uh, over uh, o o over recent months, um, just to illustrate what ministers would expect the process to, to deliver, how it, how it would operate, and what it would deliver. I mean, uh, I thank the member for the question. I also thank Lee MacArthur for his interest and, uh, again, his um, uh, guidance and some element of drafting up and helping uh, focus our direction on the bill. Uh, as well, I remember when we, uh, myself and, and Lee MacArthur had a very good conversation at very, very early stages um, uh, before even in drafting of the bill. And he mentioned, for example, house building regulations and many other uh, regulations that he thought uh, had an adverse impact on island communities and um, what I would say is a couple of things. Um, one is, despite the fact that this bill is still going through the correct parliamentary procedure and process, we're already in government island proofing or attempting to island proof as best we possible, possibly can. And the social security um, bill is an example of that, where is there, there is a, a chapter and paragraphs on um, island proofing and uh, the minister who I work closely with, uh, very, very cognizant and very aware uh, of island proofing in that context. So in some respects, we're already doing island proofing despite the fact that um, the bill hasn't uh, passed yet just to get us into that way and mode of thinking when the, avail when the bill hopefully, uh, without being presumptuous, hopefully does uh, pass through its parliamentary processes. Um, what, what I would also say uh, to the member is, I don't know if he was quite going here, but I would be wary of retrospectively um, island proofing uh, legislation. I think it would be a, a difficult and bureaucratic process, but where there are specific examples of legislation, which I know he has raised, uh, of course, with, with many others who represent islands uh, raise, then of course I would be open-minded in the government to, 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 to trying to find solutions uh, where we can, uh, but I would be very, very wary of uh, retrospectively looking at uh, an island impacting, uh, island proofing uh, uh, retrospective legislation. I mean, I welcome the, respon the, the response to, to an extent, although there will be, I think, some disappointment, not that um, a, a, an automatic retrospective application of the Island Bill uh, will apl would apply uh, immediately the, 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 the bill um, it if it's passed by Parliament receives royal assent, but that there are a number of examples where island proofing certainly would have benefited the way in which the legislation, uh, legislation and the policy development has been has been framed. And I think there will be a legitimate expectation that those areas uh, will be looked at again, given that the government and the parliament will have backed the principle of, of, of island proofing. And, and, and those decisions, that legislation, are continuing to have a fight, an effect now, whether it's in terms of possibly even um, uh, impacting upon population decline or whatever. And therefore, I think there will be an expectation that the government will look to apply those principles um, retrospectively where they're having a, a, a negative impact. I mean, uh, I accept the point that it's much better to go through an island proofing process early on as opposed to fix a problem that's been created because the island proofing didn't take place. So I, I, I uh, most certainly accept that point. 
Um, my offer still stands if there are specific pieces of legislation he thinks the government should be looking at um, that are having a real damaging impact on, on island communities. I, I can't promise him that uh, we absolutely will be able to, to take the action he wants, but um, my door is always open to having those conversations. And of course, I know my, my ministerial colleagues are the same, but um, uh, I think he also would understand the challenge, the bureaucracy, the legislative, uh, the impact it would have on the legislative timetable if we were to retrospectively look at uh, all pieces of legislation. But I, I know he's not uh, suggesting that, but uh, I would be wary of that. So maybe we have to find a, a compromise solution here, which I'm, I'm happy to, to engage him with. Could I maybe just take you up on that offer and, and suggest the impact assessment has been done through the ferries plan that has shown the shortcomings in terms of, of Orkney's internal ferry uh, services and therefore I would encourage the government to look as a matter of priority as that as an ex early example of demonstrating uh, the willingness he set out. I'm going to have allowed you to slip that um, point to do your, with your probably your constituency in and then allow Mike to come in with a follow-up question. Could I just remind members and, and the minister tactfully that time, time is always of the essence and to try and let everyone have all a chance of their questions, the, the shorter the questions and the shorter the answers without losing the meat of either would be much appreciated. So, Mike. Uh, just trying to be helpful, uh, rather than use the word retrospective, I mean, is the compromise not already in the bill in section eight, subsection two? where it says subsection one applies to the development, the delivery, but also the redevelopment of the policy strategy or service. In other words, if one of these 66 organizations develops the policy or redevelops the policy, then you must have the island proofing or impact assessment. Yes, I'm trying to be helpful. Um, you're always uh, helpful, uh, Mr. Uh, Umbos. Um, <laughs> in, in, in order to respect the convener's uh, wishes, of course, and his last remarks, I would simply say yes, yeah, you are being helpful, uh, and yes, uh, the redevelopment of policy would uh, certainly have to be island-proofed as well. So. Thank you. I'd like to move on to the next question, which is Richard Lyle. Yes, Mr. Um, you slightly touched on this earlier in another question, but under the bill, an island community impact assessment would need to be prepared when a new and revised policy strategy or service is likely to have a significant different effect on an island community. Can you um, tell the committee how monitoring review of impact assessments would work, whether there would be an appeals process, both to cover the decision to not undertake an impact assessment and the outcomes of the assessment, and where the responsibility for this would lie? Okay. Um, Again, it will be for each public body, of course, to, to perform the duties under the bill uh, as set out uh, in the guidance, which I've already uh, said. I mean, any public body which you know, failed to comply with their legal duty will be held accountable um, for these in the normal accountability arrangements. So ministers are accountable to parliament, the electorate, local authorities, to councillors and the communities and, and so on and so forth. Um, but also, uh, it would be worth saying what I've already mentioned to, to, to Mr Rumbles, that uh, when it comes to National Island Plan's progress, annual progress report, um, island proofing and how public bodies have taken forward that island proofing uh, will be, uh, will be uh, available and, and transparent. Um, when it comes to the review of any decision uh, taken by, by relevant authorities, again, we might want to look at how the equality impact assessment is done, that uh, hopefully from the fact that the engagement at the evidence gathering stage, generally stage two of that process, hopefully uh, because of that collaborative approach that's taken, uh, you would hope that um, the right decisions end up uh, being made. But uh, I, I freely admit that uh, uh, from the evidence that you've taken, uh, there is some concern around uh, the review and uh, potential reviewing of, of island impact assessment. So it's something we'll give consideration to. OK. Um, what's your view on adding further public bodies to a list of those covered? Having the duties applied to contractors or other <laughs> subsidies <laughs> of relevant public bodies? And could also ask you, does the duty on Scottish ministers extend to public agencies for which they are responsible? Did you say that last bit again, sir? Does the duty on Scottish ministers extend to public agencies for which they are responsible? Again, just taking the convener's cue, yes. And, and there is a mechanism uh, within uh, the bill whereby further public bodies could be added to uh, if they need to be uh, added um, in the future. Of course, 
again, if the committee feels strongly about a public body that should be in uh, the schedule uh, in advance of the, uh, in advance of the bill passing, then of course uh, we'll be uh, we will uh, take consideration of that. Um, I think Jamie's got a particular point on that last question. Then I'd like to bring in Raida. Sorry, Jamie. Thank you, Governor. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, could I push a little bit further on that, Minister? Um, the only reference to the government and its uh, directorates, agencies, departments is in the schedule where it says Scottish administration, number one, Scottish ministers. Um, is that the right place to uh, be more prescriptive by saying that this also covers all uh, government agencies or bodies, or could it be added in part one of the bill as a defined term, for example? It's not, it's not explicit that all Scottish government agencies are uh, affected by this. And taking it a step further, the, the other question that, that Richard asked around uh, subsidiaries or contractors of Scottish government agencies are not included. So, for example, a bus operator uh, who may, may make a, a, a change and that operator receives public subsidy and reports to Transport Scotland, for example, is not affected or not required to island proof. So I just wondered how far down the chain does this actually apply to? Um, there's a few questions on that. If it gives the committee more confidence that uh, we have Scottish ministers and their public agencies, uh, we can find a, a form of words that uh, the committee perhaps is more comfortable, because obviously a number of committee members have mentioned it now, so uh, therefore let us give consideration to wording that makes you and, and, and other committee members perhaps more comfortable that public agencies, although I believe they are uh, included, uh, perhaps we can think of a form of words that uh, gives you a little bit more uh, comfort in that regard, which is not, <clears throat> of course, uh, an unreasonable request. Um, in terms of government contracts, uh, again, I can look towards my official slightly so some guidance here that um, my understanding is that if the contract is being awarded and by, by, by government, uh, we would have to look towards um, uh, a duty of island uh, proofing uh, in that regard. Um, commercial operators are more difficult in my answer to, to Gail Ross's uh, opening question. Um, I don't even know if we would have the legislative competence to impose a duty upon a commercial operator. Again, I would look towards our legal um, uh, officials uh, for, for guidance on that, but that might be uh, more difficult. That's not to dismiss the frustration that island communities and others could have if a commercial operation um, doesn't uh, uh, leaves them frustrated, actually, because of the, the lack of service uh, that they feel they're getting. I don't know if my officials want to add something more to that particular point. Uh, yeah, in terms of, yes, it would be, in terms of island proofing, it would, the duty would fall on the public body who's doing the contracting rather than the, the operator who might do it then, but the, the island proofing would fall on them. And that's the kind of, the background to which they must do the contract in those terms. So it falls on them specifically. Um, I think in terms of legislative competence, I think we have some concerns about, um, particularly if it's utility companies where the kind of reserve nature is kind of down south and also kind of company law and other issues which is also a reserve subject it might be difficult to kind of make it impose it on them as well um, at the same time rather than just through the public body so I think we'd have to look at that more closely but I think there may well be competence issues within that. Okay, Raider, I think you had some questions and then Stuart wants to come in. And just about enforcement, um, obviously an authority looks at something, they say they've island proofed it, and it's obvious to those on islands, or indeed to Scottish ministers, that there are negative impacts on islands. What comeback, what enforcement is available to people who do that, given you know, the bill itself says in the authority's opinion um, they've almost got to get out of jail free card on that? I mean, they'll obviously be held accountable by their electorate and by their councillors, for example, if it's a local authority, and I think that's important. They'll have that duty uh, you know, for each public body, as I say, to perform the duties under the bill and in legislation, and as set out, of course, uh, in guidance. I will reflect on this idea of a review process. I think it may well be difficult, but the point of having an island proofing process, um, similar to my answer to Lee MacArthur, is that we should, island proofing should you know, local authorities, public bodies, government should get it right from the beginning as opposed to retrospectively having to fix the issue. So um, if the process is designed in such a way that it's collaborative, engaging, consultative from the beginning, then that should help to mitigate that. But I take the point the member's making that that might not always be the case. And therefore, let me take back um, how we reflect on 
on, on any type of review or review process, whether we're, we're able to incorporate that. Uh, and again, there are obviously other impact assessments in government which we can look towards, and, and I'm impressed by the thoroughness of the, uh, the, the equality impact assessment, and uh, we can perhaps learn from, from that. Stuart. Um, just a wee thing on what Scottish ministers are. Um, I hope the, uh, the, the minister and his team will take very carefully consideration of the Scottish ministers who are the law officers, who of course in certain respects are both ministers and independent, and of course the judiciary who are Scottish public bodies but should not necessarily be subject to this. I think it has been practiced in the past to put Scottish ministers there, and it's a well understood term, and I'm a bit reluctant to start to open it up and define it because I see difficulties in this area. And I've only given two minutes thought, so I will not have bottomed this one out. That may be something to take away, Minister, and consider yes. With, yes. With, with the uh, mm -hmm. requests that you've had earlier, unless you want to make a statement on it, on it now. Um, I think the, thank you, Stuart. Uh, the next question is, is Gail. Thank you. Um, Minister, we asked a question about the proposal to protect the Scottish parliamentary constituency boundary of the Western Isles from change, and it was largely agreed that that was a, a good idea. Um, coming from one of the biggest constituencies on the mainland, do you ever see this uh, being applied to remote and rural constituencies? And do you think that that would pose a problem? Because we certainly wouldn't want to see them getting any bigger, but would it prevent them from getting any smaller, which would be welcome? Um, I'm very wary of stepping on my colleagues and ministerial uh, government colleagues' toes uh, on these issues. This, of course, would be uh, for local boundary commission, then the decision is for the Minister for Parliamentary Business, as uh, the member uh, knows well. It wouldn't be for the Islands Bill, which is obviously the consideration uh, for today. Uh, that constituency boundary protection exists for, as we know, um, other local authority, uh, Holy, Holy Island local authorities. And uh, it's simply about equalising that for uh, the Western Isles. Any um, changing of the boundaries or protection for uh, other local authority areas, um, I think, would have to be looked at at their own merit if any proposal came forward. And I certainly wouldn't like to, to comment on that any further, I think. Very, very deftly dealt with, Minister. Uh, the next question is, is Mike Rumbles. Thanks, Convener. Uh, just focusing on member ward sizes now. And... Um, when we've been going around the islands, to, I mean, to give you an example, in, in Mull, they thought it was a very good idea that Mull has its own island councillor, so it was wel welcomed. But there are, there are problems in designing one and two member wards to fit into the population. So really, what, I'm asking, what I would like to know, Minister, what is going to be your role in um, the process of, re of reviewing the island ward structure and any consultation that you might have, or will it be entirely... Um, the responsibility of the, the Independent Boundary Commission to do all of this? I could try to get them some more in terms of the actual chapter and verse, but you know, the statutory process and the responsibilities as such are set out in, uh, obviously in, in, in relevant uh, legislation. In terms of the process of reviewing island ward structures, I would concur with um, what Mr Rumbles has said, that um, many island communities see this uh, as a good thing, but uh, ultimately most of them understand that it is the responsibility of, of the Commission. Now, once that review has been complete, as he knows, the Commission will then make recommendations to Ministers, and it's that stage that Ministers are involved. Now, ultimately, the decision is still for the Minister for Parliamentary Business. However, I, I would imagine that, um, and, and again, I, be careful here uh, what I say, but I would imagine that if it was particularly affecting the island communities, he may well want to take the view of the island's Minister at the time uh, as well. Uh, but ultimately it would be his decision to, to make. And I'm getting at is the process will be entirely at the, for the Independent Boundary Commission until it reports yes. to, to yes. ministers. Yeah. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, John. So could I pursue that a little bit further, Minister? If, if, a, if a ward currently is four member and partly island, partly mainland, and we allow the island one to be kind of, the, the ward to be subdivided so that the island has one or two seats, that would leave the mainland part of the ward with one or two, one or two seats potentially. So there would be a knock-on effect on the mainland, 
um, and I'm just wondering how that would be dealt with, whether we would allow one or two member wards on the mainland or whether it would mean that the whole, that whole authority, like Highland or North Ayrshire, would have to be rejigged. Yeah, it would be only for islands. Um, uh, so I suppose the knock-on of that would be that it, it could be a potential that you could increase the number of, of councillors or elected members in that entire local authority uh, jurisdiction or area, and that's a, that's a possible knock-on effect. But um, for the purposes of, of member ward size, we're talking about island uh, communities only that could be one or two. S sorry, if I could just have one more shot at that. It, I wasn't thinking of increasing the number of councillors in total. I was assuming they would stay the same. But I'm, I'm, suggest I'm asking if a ward is split you could have a, a, a ward that's too small on the mainland, and I just wonder how that would be dealt with. Um, can I say that it would really be for the Local Boundary Commission to make those recommendations? If I can go back to, in terms again, of getting chapter and verse uh, on what the implications would be for the mainland, uh, for example, if there was a one or two member ward, I don't want to give them, of course, incorrect uh, or incomplete uh, information. So let me reflect on that and, and give them, if I could, uh, okay. convene a, a written response on that. A, a written response would be welcome. <coughs> if you just uh, submit it in the normal way to the clerks, we'll make sure it's distributed. The next question is, is John Finney. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Minister, uh, a couple of questions and, and some others are going to be coming up on the issue of marine development. Now, acknowledging that the local authorities all start from a different place, indeed the island authorities start it, from a, a different place. Is having a licensing power control at local authority level the correct approach? There are, uh, of course, community mm -hmm. groups. It could be yes. yes, I mean, I believe it is uh, the, the correct approach. We want to provide uh, an opportunity for local authorities, but importantly, as he says, and their communities to have more control of the development uh, in the seas uh, around the island. I mean, I believe you heard from some local authorities who would, uh, for example, like to see provisions in the bill that would be make it easier for them to manage uh, and use any revenues. I'm sympathetic with that approach. Uh, we'll work with authorities. But it also goes back to some uh, of the questions that have come previously, that there's no doubt at all it's a desire for communities. But local authorities that I've spoken to understand that desire from local communities are willing to work closely with them uh, around development uh, that could benefit their particular island. Uh, and I see that uh, not being restricted or inhibited at all by the provisions that we we're suggesting in the, the, the marine development part of the bill. Intention with the revenue uh, generated by this power is, please. Well, uh, again, we'd like to see provisions in the bill would make it easier for them to, to, to manage and use any revenues for the development. So uh, you'll know for the actual, uh, for the actual kind of, uh, licensing, uh, they can cover their costs, so they'll be able to cover that as part of the, the mechanisms in the bill in terms of the revenue that's generated from development it would depend on the type of development. And there are some, some, some uh, again, uh, legislative uh, hurdles they might have to go through here, but ultimately it should be easier for them to, to, to manage and use revenues which might well be for community purposes, of course. Uh, that might be one of the purposes. In fact, in many of the conversations I have with local authorities and island communities, uh, that is the reason why they want to do these marine developments, is to put back into the communities uh, that, would, that, that they hopefully can benefit from that development. Uh, can I maybe cite two of the, the suggested changes and additions we've had to the bill? And uh, these include, and I quote here, it should be made clear that any form of dredging does not refer to fishing activity. And another one, scallop dredging and demersal trawling should be added to the definition of uh, dredging, uh, which I'd be more sympathetic to. Um, this is a, a complicated area. This proposal, how will the um, provisions interact with existing legislation and why uh, uh, the, the differences in activities covered by the proposed licence scheme from those um, already in the Marine Scotland Act? Um, what I would say is that we obviously have currently a couple of good examples of how it might work because, uh, of course, we've taken this uh, largely and developed and expanded upon uh, Zetland and Orkney County Council Acts of 1974. So they provide good examples of how a local authority might work alongside uh, Marine Scotland and within the current national framework and, and licensing regime. So we have a couple of kind of good examples of how that works. Uh, that being said, to, to give further comfort, the bill does uh, require that Scottish ministers must consult widely before laying draft regulations before the Parliament. And any issues of concerns that stakeholders uh, might have, uh, they'll be able to inform as the development of the regulations goes through its process. Um, these regulations obviously ultimately need agreed and approved by Parliament as well, which give you further, um, hopefully, further comfort. In terms of the specifics around um, dredging, I know my colleague Ian Turner looked uh, a little bit more detail into this, so if it's okay, I'll maybe bring him in on, on that specific point. 
Yeah, in terms of it's uh, 161B, yes, it, um, development activity includes dredging. Um, but we didn't anticipate it actually it would also be fishing as well. So we would specifically, I think, probably want to be clear about dredging does not include fishing. But I did see, as yourself saw, there was two different people on the same issue on the different sides. So I think I'd like to explore that a little bit more to go before that before we um, think about changing the bill in those terms. I'd be welcome the views of the committee as well um, on that matter. Okay. Is it, is it possible we could hear back from the minister on that? Yes. That issue. Sure. Thank you very much indeed. Just, just before we uh, leave that, if I can just follow up on something John said, is uh, devolution of powers as, as, as far down as you can get them to communities or even to uh, or councils and communities. I mean, there are there is a method of appeal for marine regulations, which if it was passed down to a decision to communities, they might not be able to fund uh, any defence of an appeal uh, against a decision had been made. And I wondered what the government's view on that is, because obviously with responsibility, or with, with responsibility comes liability. And I'm, I'm worried if, if, if it's been fully considered the costs that may be passed on with allowing that power to go down and how you'd cope with it, Minister. Again, again, I'll look into it in a bit more detail, if I may, uh, convene. I think uh, the whole point of our deliberations at uh, stage one, uh, we've heard from a number of island communities, and it hasn't been raised to me that they have any concerns around the liability. Uh, and it can be true that they'll often see the opportunity without perhaps considering fully the risks and the liability, and I accept that point. But it's not an issue that they have raised uh, much concern. But also, I would just go back to my previous answer to John Finney, that we have a good example or two good examples of how it already works. If you look at Shetland and Orkney with the Zetland and Orkney County Council Acts, what we're doing is essentially expanding upon those provisions. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think uh, that gives us a, a kind of real practical examples of how it works. So it hasn't been something that's raised, uh, been raised with me uh, as, as, as an issue, but um, it's certainly that's not dismissing uh, the fact that it's an important and salient point, so uh, we'll reflect on, on it. Thank you. I think it'd be useful to, to make sure that we're not uh, burdening uh, communities with, with costs that they might not be able to manage. Stuart. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to just initially talk a little bit about Section 18 uh, island licensing areas, and this is a bit technical. Uh, the first is Scottish ministers have to be satisfied in the area includes an inhabited island. What does includes mean? Because the area that's being licensed is sea, not land. So does it mean that the sea area has to go round the entire boundary of the island? Or does it merely mean that the island needs to be adjacent to it? And I particularly illustrate that by saying, if you take a big island like Mull, you might want to do something in the northwest that you don't necessarily want to do in the southeast. So what does includes mean? We'll hand to uh, the bill team uh, to give you an exact definition of includes, if I may. And uh, Ian, uh, we want to come in on that point. Answering this one, Ian. I'm just giving you a moment to gather your thoughts as you, as you think about them. Ian. I, I, th I think I know where you're coming from. The, it's Section 17 and Section 18 work together in these ways. The island marine area, as you see in Section 17, talks about adjacent to an island and 12 nautical miles from out with that. In order to apply for a designation, though, the, Scot the local authority must have an inhabited island within its area. So it doesn't matter about what that is as long as it's got an inhabited island area, which means it's the six local authorities uh, within inhabited islands in Scotland. So those two work together. Then once you work out, yes, it's an local authority, yes, they can do it, the 12 nautical miles then can apply, and then that's what the regulations would deal with when you talk about what the boundary might be, because the boundaries might stretch to the coast or it might stretch between different local authorities, and there's different ways you can do that, such as the uh, marine order of last year for the regional marine planning had a different particular way of using those areas but there are other different mechanisms you might use as well or different boundaries you might use and I think that's what the consultation and the regulations and the process would have. Can I just say I understand perfectly it has to be within the Scottish Island Marine Area but you're almost leading me to the point that it's coterminous with the boundaries of that rather than the subset of that is that correct? Um, yes this, the Scottish Island Marine Area is that is determined by section 17 of the bill yes. yes. Yes, but, but, I'm now talk, but I'm talking about the island licensing area, which is what is covered, may, has to Yes, include. which goes up to the limit of those 12 nautical miles. No, no, but I'm not, I'm not interested in, it's not the limit, it's the, does 
the island licensing area has to include an inhabited island. So what I'm, well, what I'm saying is... That no. No, it goes for, it's adjacent to an island, so that's not necessarily an inhabited uh, island. Well, in I'm sorry. It, that, no, no, that is number in the, 17. In yes. 18, the island licensing area, regulations may designate the area only if Scottish ministers are satisfied that the area includes an inhabited island. So that's a, a different definition from Scottish island marine area, and, and properly so. I think I would need to look at that in a bit more detail just to make yeah, sure we've well, got the wording. Well, I think, let me I give think you the, if, if you're going to look at it in detail, that's fine. But let me just give you the other one. Um, and the particular one I'm thinking about is Butte and Arran, which are in different local authorities, where you might want to create uh, an island licensing area that is in between. I don't know you will, but you might, within those two areas. And therefore, there are two local authorities involved. Yeah. Would you create two areas? Uh, that abut, or would you create one area and give the responsibility to one local? It, the the, bill the, the would answer could follow as well. Yeah, the bill would anticipate that you would have, the, the application would need to come from both authorities in that way to, de to designate the area. And then you might be able to construct some regulations which would work around that, but then you would need to do it in that way. So. Right, okay. You're alert to what I'm saying. Yes. Right. The, 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 the other sort of more broad thing, which uh, is just uh, why are we doing this in this Act rather than the Marine Scotland Act? Uh, by amending that, or the Community Empowerment Act. I think the bill provides you know, a clear approach of how any, how any new licensing scheme must be developed and, and uh, will work side along, uh, alongside sorry, the current legislation that exists. But you know, this has been a desire from many island communities that I've travelled to, even before my time, of course, speaking to my predecessor, they would like to have more powers of, over marine uh, licensing in the way that um, Shet Shetland and Orkney have, in fact, to develop upon that. So I think this bill is, is the correct place to put it in because of the historic nature of the island's bill, um, but also is very kicking nice and of working alongside the current frameworks that exist, including uh, marine region orders and so on and so forth. And finally, um, given that this is a provision that can create a benefit for a community, but it does so by restricting the activities of developers potentially, how are you going to consult to make sure we get the right balance between the, the various interests that might be affected by the creation of an island licensing area? Well, you know, again, finding that balance between, uh, of course, uh, what we want to do, empowering uh, local island uh, communities, um, having uh, for those that wish to have a marine uh, licensing um, remit, uh, we don't want to hamper development and include, uh, sorry, inhibit uh, uh, development. And again, I go back to my previous answer that we have good examples of how it works in terms of Shetland and, and, and Orkney. Um, the consultation would happen in a very open manner. It would involve organisations, but crucially businesses, uh, as well as communities, of course. And it's important that those who will be impacted by the provisions have the opportunity uh, to, to feed into the process at a very, very early stage. But it's to give reassurance to the member, very cognisant and aware, uh, as are local island communities and authorities, that they, they may well want these powers, but have to ensure that they are not creating any uh, particular bureaucratic challenges or hurdles and in fact it would be of course counterproductive uh, to the island to do so. Just quickly, Mr. Mr. Steve Snacks have touched on the point I was actually going to make. concerns me that you know the 12 nautical miles we could have two authorities, two, two local authorities who could have a, a power or a seize grab um, by these authorities on the seabed or whatever. So I think we better, Mr Turner, uh, set it out fairly so everyone knows where they're coming from. Um, I, I, I was going to make just one point that on, on, on this idea that boundaries um, you know, maybe will overlap, I think it's a reasonable point, or islands boundaries maybe I'll uh, touch on to, to, to mainland uh, boundaries, um, you know, uh, given a helpful uh, illustrative map which is, uh, explains there's a Scottish Marine Regions Order 2015 which just shows that the demarcation of boundaries through consultation and conversation between local authorities um, can actually, you can get to a point where they all agree where the various demarcation and boundaries are. So we've already done that in a fairly recent uh, um, a piece of uh, legislation here, Scottish Marine Region Order uh, 2015. So it's not insurmountable and um, I'm not convinced we'll get to the stage of land grabs, uh, I'm sure. Well, that will not, not be the case. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to bring Peter in uh, yeah. next. I've just got one specific point. Uh, you know, we, we do realise that these uh, powers are, are fairly limited, but we have heard from several witnesses uh, that they, they think fish farming should actually come under these uh, licensing rules and be, you know, so the local communities have some input into uh, fish farming issues. Are you, are you sympathetic to that or not? Dean, because I know he's had specific conversations with, uh, on this issue. Uh, yes, fish farming is um, um, not included as development activity under Section 16.2D. That's particularly because it is already including in the planning regime. Um, so that's where the legislation would bite in terms of fish farming in that, in that respect. Um, that's also the case for the Zetland and the Orkney Acts as well. That's excluded within those and fish farming is taken under planning. So and under planning, that's where the communities have, can have an involvement, it's where local authorities have an involvement. So that's where we would see that being, rather than being having another regime on top of that in terms of which the local authority would also have to do. So there'd be quite a lot of issues about um, having the same, doing the same thing in two different ways potentially under marine licensing and also under planning in that way. So we didn't think that was appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Reda. Ask about uh, marine designations and their management. Um, I know island communities, well, some island communities are really keen to take this on and also manage those designations themselves. But evidence we received last week from SNH kind of indicated to me they were not keen to devolve any of those powers to to island communities. Do you see this as being something that we could move forward on? Because I know it's an ambition. Yeah. I mean, I, I could take it forward as an issue. I don't think it would be for the, the bill uh, necessarily um, in terms of marine designation, but it's certainly an issue that I, along with the Cabinet Secretary for uh, the Environment, uh, if there was a specific issue that the member uh, wanted to raise with us, we could take that back. Um, again, it, um, it has been raised on occasion, I should say, and some of the island visits um, that, that I've done, but if the minister, uh, sorry, if the member wanted me to raise it um, and have a conversation with SNH, then, then of course I could take it forward. I don't think it would be necessarily in the scope of the conversation we're having today. Um, but yeah, uh, it's on the record and I'll, I'll have a look at that specific issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Right, the next question is John. Uh, thanks, Convener. Just uh, really on the financial memorandum, Minister, um, the figures, I mean, we, we, have, we do understand that the, this is to do with the admin consulting, all that kind of thing. It's not going to build new hospitals or anything like that. So could I just have your thoughts on, on some of the figures? Uh, I mean, for example, under representation of island communities, it talks about 30,000 per authority. Um, and again, under development of the Scottish Marine Island Marine area, £25,000 for each consultation. I mean, are these kind of intended to be average figures or... How does that work? Because the, the six authorities will be facing quite different situations. The language specifically in, on, uh, tries to mirror and tries to reflect um, that very issue. The local authorities, depending on, on, on the size of the islands and their uh, local authority area, will have different costs associated. So, uh, for example, representation of island uh, communities, local authority estimates costs up to 30,000, so very purposely using that language, that some may well be less than that, but we don't certainly don't envisage uh, any, any, any more than that. So yes, very much the, the, the costs have been done in conjunction uh, with local authorities, in consultation with local authorities uh, as well. We've also obviously looked at um, other consultations the government has taken forward, what's been the cost involved in some of them, uh, some of those consultations, and uh, try to reflect those costs in which we think are, are very reasonable. Okay, um, I have a final question for you, Minister. In the, in the, in the bill, it suggests that... Sorry, did Jamie want to come in? Oh, sorry, Jamie, yeah. Sorry, my mistake. Then I'll no, come to my final question. Sorry, Jamie, I apologise. appreciate that. Uh, it, it falls on nicely from uh, the previous question, and I think it is worth pushing this point that uh, surely as a... The, the financial memorandum talks about the administrative costs of delivery of the, the bill, and that's fine. My concern is around the duties placed in part three of the bill around having regard to island communities and not just the preparation of island assessments but the consequences of those. So for example, and I think it's worth actually listing an example here, um, if any of the bodies that's listed in the schedule, any of the 66 bodies, make a decision which has a detrimental effect on an island, to counteract that will require, surely will require financial backing. So for example, the decision to close a GP surgery or a school on an island, or a reduction of ambulance services, or changing a bus route, or any other 
any other decision made by any of the comprehensive list of bodies made in the schedule, to combat those naturally will require financial funding to ensure that there's no negative effect on an island. So how can we, uh, how can we, we balance this of preparing island assessments, identifying what the negative effect of a policy decision or redevelopment might be, but then not being able to back that up with any government funding to ensure that there is no negative effect. And that, that's something that's really missing from all of this. If we went down that route, there would be a, a, a blank cheque that none of us would be able to, to, to fill in at all. The purpose of the financial memorandum is to support the provisions within the bill. Financially, obviously, cost those provisions that are within the bill. And you have to separate out the process um, uh, to, to carry out an island impact assessment and then what the effects of that, uh, the consequences of that act, uh, of, the, of that um, impact assessment are. So if an impact assessment is conducted, uh, let's just take a, a local authority, for example, would then have the option of continuing with the status quo, despite the fact that it might have a negative impact. It would have the option, of course, of changing whatever it was passing or whatever process, uh, legislation it was passing or strategy it was passing so that it took cognizance of the impact assessment. Um, or indeed, they just dropped what they were going to do in the, in the first place. Now, they would have that option, whichever they took would have potentially a financial consequence, but it would be for them, for the local authority, the public sector body, or if it's the government, indeed, for the government uh, to take on and shoulder um, that financial um, consequence. So there's a massive amount of work being undertaken uh, in, in, in government um, in terms of a range of different policy areas, tackle the many challenges the island communities face, um, you know, investment in housing, ferry services, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that funding will continue, but clearly, when it comes to the consequences of an island impact assessment, uh, that will be for the public body, the local authority, or the government to take a decision on and be cognizant of their own financial resource that is available to them. Just to be clear, all this bill does is say they have to identify the impact that that decision will have on an island, but not necessarily mitigate it. Well, effectively, it would be a choice for the, the, the government, the local authority, the public sector body, uh, whoever is carrying out the impact assessment, whether or not they chose to, to mitigate uh, or not. Uh, that is the point of the, an impact assessment. It's their choice. Now, it would go down, I imagine, like a you know, lead balloon uh, if the impact assessment uh, clearly showed there was a negative uh, impact on island communities, but uh, a public sector body or a local authority chose to ignore that, um, they would have to answer to that. And of course, as I've already said in my answer to, to Mike Rumble's um, progress reports, it would be in the National Islands Plan on an annual basis. So that would be pretty transparent uh, as well. I'm going to allow John to come in, but I, I, I do have a question. So I'd ask you to try to keep yours as short as possible so I can get mine in as well, Ms. Finney. Sorry. Um, just to, to go on from Jamie Green's debate there, I mean, clearly any decision that any one of the, the three exclusively island authorities would take. I mean, not every decision could have a, 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 a um, will have an impact on islands. Whereas you could argue that the the implication of the downside of that is more applicable to the three island authorities. Is there an opportunity, for instance, therefore that that could be reflected in the local government and other um, um, budget uh, decisions? Um, I'm loath to, to mention COSLA, but um, I mean, that, that, it, it, you, you could have an element of that applying in, in the overall settlements. I will look at my officials for this, but I think they already get a special islands needs allowance, and, and that is there to specifically, uh, of course, address issues around uh, issues that are specific to, of course, islands in the budgetary process. Well, then, if, if it's already catered for, why do we have this bill? One no, no, I thought you meant about the financial implications. Yes. So the budgetary, uh -huh. I mean, this bill is not only about the financial, this bill is around island proofing measures, which I agree with them. I mean, when it comes to holy island communities, do they effectively island proof already? Well, I suspect they do because you know, it's, 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 it's island, but uh, we have to understand it's wider than just the three holy, holy island uh, communities um, when it comes to marine license uh, uh, powers, marine licensing powers. We know okay, Orkney and Shetland, but we know the other local authorities uh, necessarily don't have those powers. Uh, as of now, member wards. So I think there's many good things that island, even Holy Island communities can get out of this bill. Um, but in terms of the, I thought the question he was asking was around budget and finance and the unique nature of island communities, I would say that's already catered for in the, in the special islands need allowance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I, 
uh, just a very quick question from me. The island's plan has to be produced within a year of, of the bill being passed. Uh, it sounds like you have visited quite a lot of islands and there are quite a few more to go. Uh, are you confident that you can deliver it within a year, having spoken all, to all the bodies that need to be spoken to? Yes, I think it's uh, ambitious, but it's achievable. It will be challenging, but uh, we're not starting from a blank uh, canvas or a blank sheet of paper. Uh, as you allude to, I've already, you know, a lot of work has been done by my officials uh, and myself uh, in that regard, so we're not starting from a blank sheet of paper. Um, but uh, again, if it gave the committee particular concern, particular worry, we could reflect on, on the timescale, but I think it is uh, absolutely achievable. I should also say, despite the fact that I've visited 30 islands, I don't think I would uh, uh, go get around uh, the other 63 before the, the 12 months, so uh, that shouldn't be an expectation. But uh, where I can uh, get to many more, I, I certainly will try to do my best. Okay. Thank you, Minister. I'd like to thank you and your team for giving evidence to the committee this morning. Um, I'd like now to suspend the meeting for five minutes to allow the changeover of witnesses.
I'd now like to move to agenda item three, which is rail service in Scotland. This is the latest in our regular evidence sessions to obtain an update on rail services and rail network issues. I'd like to wel welcome Alex Hines, David Dixon and Angus Tom uh, to give evidence to the committee. Now, before we give evidence, I think there are some declarations we'd like to make. Stuart, would you like to start, please? Thank you. I'd just like to uh, draw members' attention in my registers of interest. I'm an or the honorary president of the Scottish Association of Public Transport and honorary vice president of Rail Future UK. Rhoda. Um, I've got a uh, referred members to my register of interests. Um, I am an honorary vice president of the Friends of the Far North. Now. Okay, John. Uh, I co-convene the cross-party group on rail. Uh, Gail. I also refer members to my register of interests and um, as Rhoda Grant, I am an honorary vice president of Friends of the Far North Line. Uh, John Finney. Thank you. I too am a member of the cross-party group on rail and a member of the RMT parliamentary group. Thank you. Um, having uh, completed those, there's no one else that's missed out. No, okay. The first question then will be to Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you uh, very much indeed and uh, welcome. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps uh, just give us an update on how the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Project is going and in particular perhaps how the <coughs> apparent delays in the delivery of the 385 rolling stock uh, might impact on uh, where we're uh, progressing to. Yeah, of course. Well, good morning. Um, well, I'm pleased to say that the electrification of the Edinburgh-Glasgow line is now fully complete uh, and that infrastructure is now in use. Uh, we have the Class 385 trains, the brand new Hitachi state-of-the-art trains on test between Edinburgh-Glasgow. That testing is going well. Um, in fact, just last night, we delivered a test run which delivered a journey time of 42 minutes with uh, four stops, uh, which was pleasing to see. As we know, uh, and as the committee is well versed upon, uh, the electrification of the line has been delivered 10 months late. Clearly, uh, we're not going to allow the delivery of the new trains to customers to be 10 months late, uh, which is why we're working with Itachi. Uh, the, the operator, the infrastructure manager and the Office of Rail Regulation to make sure we can introduce the 385s into traffic as early as we can in the new year. But I'm pleased to say that we will be introducing our modern Class 380s onto passenger services at the December timetable change uh, this December so customers can begin to uh, benefit from faster uh, greener and uh, longer trains. Um, just at the risk of moving off Egypt, uh, where are the 380s come from? Because presumably they're being used somewhere at the present. Well, we've got a um, big cascade of the fleet happening across the, the network. It's like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Uh, we do have uh, the, some spare 380s which we can deploy onto the electrified route, which actually enables us to uh, free up diesels, which enables us to introduce service introductions starting in December, for example, between Dumfries and Carlisle. So from December, we will operate a near hourly service on that route, an extra 1,500 seats per day. And that benefit to customers in that part of Scotland is delivered from the electrification and the subsequent diesel cascade of rolling stock. Uh, Jamie Green, I think you're next. Thank you, Governor, and good morning, panel. <clears throat> I think you partially answered my question uh, on the uh, changes that we're expecting to see in December of this year. Um, I wondered if uh, you could maybe expand on that, if there are any other uh, benefits or changes that passengers between Glasgow and Edinburgh might see after the, uh, the December 17 timetable change. And indeed, if you have any estimations or guarantees on when we'll expect to see um, eight-car trains and 42-minute journeys on that line. That's my first question. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, as you know, we're in the process of building the best railway Scotland's ever had, and every bit of the network will benefit from brand new trains, refurbished trains, faster journeys, more seats, and more services. And that's a process which starts in uh, next month and there'll be a gradual introduction of those benefits to customers happening across 
uh, the, uh, the, 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 the country's rail network between now and December 2019. So I've highlighted some of the benefits for customers this December. Next May, uh, we begin the reintroduction of a genuine intercity network for Scotland connecting the seven cities using the high-speed train where we replace three-car diesel trains with four and five-car intercity trains. And we hope to be operating the eight-car brand new Hitachi trains between Edinburgh and Glasgow with a 42-minute journey time in December of next year. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of focus on the electrification of Edinburgh Glasgow line, but we're actually electrifying pretty much the whole of the central belt. So we're electrifying the route uh, uh, via Falkirk, Grahamston, up to Stirling, Dunblane, Alloa. And the combination of that electrification with the core Edinburgh Glasgow route enables us to move slower diesel services out of the way so we can deliver the 42 minute journey time. And compared to today, where we operate six car diesel trains in the peak, an eight car electric train has 44% more seats. And of course, we're slashing the journey times as well. So, lots of benefits for customers in the pipeline, which they will start to see in December. Uh, thank you for that update. So just to clarify, uh, the eight-car, 42-minute journey on the Glasgow line, we should expect to see uh, in December of next year, 2018. Correct. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, there was talk, talk in the past uh, in connecting uh, our two cities um, with a, uh, a some, at one point before my time in this parliament and perhaps before your time at ScotRail around a, a, a non-stop 30-minute journey being a potential. Uh, has there been any further exploratory work done on that? Uh, and do you think at some point in the future that could be realistic? In, not to the best of my knowledge, no. I mean, obviously, if the trains don't stop, uh, we can deliver a journey time uh, which is rather better than 42 uh, minutes. But clearly, that route provides a vital commuter service both into Glasgow and into Edinburgh at both ends in both directions. So uh, clearly, if you're talking about the movement of customers, uh, I think the current balance between capacity and journey time is probably one which is right for, for that route. Um, but clearly, that's something we keep under review. Have you done any exploratory work into the percentage of passengers that get on at Glasgow and get off at Edinburgh or vice versa? So, uh, and I'm not talking about reducing services that are currently provided on the, the four or, or multiple stops, but actually uh, the potential of providing additional services where there could be non-stop capability. I mean, I think you know one of the challenges of operating the Edinburgh Glasgow route it's it's not a traditional rail route where one would expect there to be a peak direction. Uh, on that route, there isn't a peak direction uh, because customers are travelling both ways, uh, which makes uh, our job slightly harder than it would ordinarily be. Um, we believe that the eight-car electric trains, which we'll deliver in December next year with a 42-minute journey time, will deliver the right balance for customers uh, into Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, either commuters into those locations or those people making the city-to-city -city connection. Just, just before we move on, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I may have missed it. Uh, the 385s, where, where you said there's a delay and we've, we know and understand there is a delay. So when are they going to be delivered? So, well, some of them are delivered today. You know, the trains are on test between Edinburgh and Glasgow. As okay, but those are the test, test ones. Yeah. So, so once they've gone through we, testing yeah. and, and you're happy that they deliver what you yeah. want, um, when are the rest being rolled out and delivered? Well, after they've finished their testing programme, which is not something I'm uh, in total control of, and these trains each need to be accepted onto the network, tested, they need what's called type approval, and they also have to do a number of fault-free miles before we can introduce them into traffic reliably. So we're expecting uh, 21 trains to be with us and available for service for February. For February? Yeah. Okay, so... Just so I've got this, that they'll be, you're hoping they'll be here in February, ready to go and, and delivering a service. Well, we already have trains here in Scotland. 385s. On test, 385s. Yeah. We're expecting further deliveries this month. 
Um, but it's not just a question of having them here and built and in Scotland. We have to test and accept them. It's a very complicated... So you test and accept each one individually? You, you type accept the train, yeah. the class 385, that has to be accepted onto the UK rail network, but we test each train individually to make sure it's as built and it's reliable, and each unit has to do a number of fault-free miles before we're prepared to introduce it into traffic. You know, the, 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 the service between Edinburgh and Glasgow is very good. I commute on it every single day. It's a reliable service, and the last thing that customers would want is for us to rush the introduction of those trains into traffic and us to see a dip in reliability. So, you know, I've taken the decision I would rather see a more gradual, phased uh, introduction to service to maintain our punctuality standards on that route. Okay, so I don't think I get the terminology right, but let's see if I can get it right this time. So the 385s introduced into traffic will be in February? Well, I, I can't guarantee that. That's your plan? Because, no, it, it, I can't. The service introduction programme, we hope to deliver 385s into traffic early next year. But it's not a process that I'm wholly in control of because uh, Hitachi, the rail regulator, the operator and network rail all need to work together to make sure that this train is accepted and tested so we can then introduce it into traffic. So as we stand here today, I'm not yet prepared to make a commitment as to when that will happen uh, because of the complexity of, of what we're trying to achieve. Okay, um, right. I think, I, th I think I've got that. I'm going to bring Raider in and, 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 and then maybe, maybe come back and I've just thought that one through. Sorry. So it, it was just on exactly the same issue about trying to drill down to when we can expect people to be using those trains when they'll be online. You'd initially said the beginning of the year, then you said February for that you would have them for testing, if I'm correct. But I just wonder when you would expect them to be in service and carrying passengers. Customers, customers will benefit from faster, greener, longer trains from December this year, i.e. next month. Yeah. So customers will begin to benefit from that. And the answer to your question in terms of 385s is as soon as possible in the new year. I can't give you a cast iron guarantee because it's not a process I'm wholly responsible for. So we will introduce those services into passenger traffic as soon as we possibly can, as long as it's sensible to do so. I'm just, I suppose, I'm really keen to know what I'm, 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 I'm happy to, sorry, Stuart, Stuart, can I bring Stuart in and come back to you, Rhoda, and then we'll, we'll, no, because the next question, Stuart, sorry. I, I'm trying to be helpful. In December, we will get class 380 electric trains yep. running the service yep. until we can get the 385s on. Exactly. And the 380s themselves are trains that uh, are roughly four or five years old. They're yeah, quite modern. Huge, in other words. Modern, yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah, Brady, do you want to come back? I'm, I'm not, I suppose, what would your ambition be to have the 385s? I mean, given no, a fair I'm, wind. I mean, you, you, you have given us caveats yeah. about and, yeah. I, and I, I, yeah. get, I get So, that. So, my ambition is not to make promises I can't keep. <laughs> Um, and my, and my, and, and my, my ambition is to keep the customer uh, at the heart of the decision making, which is why we're going to introduce 380s into traffic in December. So we'll be operating seven car electric trains with faster journey times next month. And the 385 introduction, we will see as soon as we can in the new year. I can't give a cast iron guarantee because uh, what we're doing is complicated. This is a brand new train it's a brand new type of train onto brand new infrastructure and we need to make sure we get it right well i've been talking to an operator locally in my area in Morsend, and basically i'm told that these trains come up from england run about in our track a bit like train sets run about in our track all night during the night because you're basically it's like when we all got a new car we had to run it in, right? No, not now, not now, not now. You know, let me finish. 
Um, and basically, now the trains that you're getting, you have to run them in and make sure that they're working, make sure that everyone's OK before you put them out to, for people to play on them. Yes? Exactly. And we have to do it at night because there isn't enough track capacity in the day because we're providing... And that's why you come to Scotland, to because there's plenty of track to run about in, in Scotland. And, and mainly it's a, um, within, the central, within the central belt, correct? Well, what we've been doing is because the electrification has only recently been delivered between Edinburgh and Glasgow, we've been doing the testing programme on the East Coast Main Line as well and some testing actually in Germany to short circuit the testing to enable us to operate the trains into service as soon as we can. Because obviously the infrastructure has been 10 months late. We don't want the service introduction to be 10 months late. So we've been um, working around the issue to see what testing we can do where, both in this country and abroad, to get those trains into traffic as soon as we can. So before I move on to my questions that have, have been allocated, uh, the other factor is Hitachi complained that the fact that they couldn't get access to the system, and that's why they were delayed. So, is that is that true or not true? Who, whose fault was it that, that there's a, been the delay? Hitachi's or yours? That has been a factor insofar as um, one of the, as apart from testing the infrastructure and testing the train, you actually have to test the compatibility between the train and the infrastructure. And obviously that element of the testing you can't do until that infrastructure is available. So it is true to say that the late delivery of the electrification has contributed to the um, delays which we're seeing now with Hitachi. About it, isn't it? It's really yeah. simple well, when you think about it. Anyway, I'll now move on to my questions. You know, it's nice to get it right. Um, basically, uh, I have the, behind me, where I, where I stay, I have the Hollytown Junction. I'm 100 yards away from the station. And you're then, uh, so the electrification for Hollytown Junction to Mid Calder Junction. How are we doing on that? How is, uh, can you give us an update on the Shorts Line electrification project? And I know we had to heighten a few bridges um, over the last couple of years for this. So can you tell me where we are with that? So... The whole investment programme uh, on Scotland's railway, um, including the electrification of the line to Stirling Dumb Lane Alloway and the Shots line upgrade, is all proceeding to time and within the overall funding envelope. So we expect to deliver an electrified Shots line and an electrified line to Stirling Dumb Lane Alloway next year. That's on programme and within the overall borrowing headroom. I don't know whether, David, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, it's the, the programme is actually marginally ahead of um, target just now, so it's delivering extremely well, uh, as is the rest of the electrification programme. So, as Alex has said, it's to programme, it's to budget, um, and we don't anticipate that changing. It's, it's progressing extremely well. I look forward to that because, you're, you know, your electric trains... From where I see, it seem to have more carriages than what the diesel ones have. And so I'll, I'll leave that as it is. But you touched on the Stirling Dumblain Alloa. Um, can you give us an update on that? And also, I noticed that the, the ORR commissioned an independent reporter, Nicholas, to review whether Network Rail was doing everything reasonably practical to deliver the milestone in this project. And can I say, I'm very impressed with Network Rail. We were at the Cuttysat Bridge on... Friday, last Friday, uh, both my colleague Philip McGregor and I, and amazing, you know, and what, what, what they are doing. But basically, this report, it's not been made public. Why is that? Well, just before we move on to the Stirling Dumblain Alloa, you talked about the number of train carriages. The number of train carriages at our disposal goes from 800 to 1,000 between now and December 2019. That's a 25% increase in the number of carriages available, but we're going to operate those more intensively. So the actual number of seat miles between now and December 2019 goes up by 45%. This is an extraordinary increase in the quality and the capacity of Scotland's yeah. railway. I see it every time I go on a train. Uh, sadly not, um, but it will address crowding levels and it will also create room for growth. 
You know, we've seen extraordinary growth in Scotland's railway, which we should be very proud of. And by increasing the quality and the capacity of Scotland's rail network, we'll be able to do more to provide jobs and growth for the people who work and live here. On the SDA in terms of the Nichols report, David? Uh, I, I can't tell you in terms of, you know, it's being published or otherwise, but... I mean, S SDA as a programme now is going extremely well. Our first major milestone is, you might hear the term Section A, which is for May next year, which accommodates an awful lot of the stuff that is to happen on the Edinburgh Glasgow. And it's, it's the wrong thing to do is look at them entirely in isolation. Um, SDA in many ways facilitates a lot of the things that we need to happen on the main Edinburgh Glasgow electrification. So Section A is on target for May 18. So that's progressing well. Um, as a project, it's progressing well. Everything now is to, to programme and pretty well to budget. Um, so we see that section A, which takes us up kind of just short of Stirling Station, but not into Stirling Station. So um, we see good progress on that. And that will facilitate some of the things we want to see uh, for, the, for the May timetable. The key after that is, is going up um, to Dunblane. Um, Etc., but not across to Alloa then for the end of the year, for December, and then through the Alloa branch to uh, March 19. Now, all of that is progressing well. Some of the issues around Stirling Station, for instance, and the approaches to Stirling, uh, we have had protracted planning issues, but we're making our way through that now. Um, we do have the planning permissions for Kers Road, which was looking a bit of an issue, uh, potentially around there, that might hold up the project, but we're making good progress on that. So a lot of the things that we saw as potential obstacles are moving out the way. As I say, progress is going very well. We've learned quite a lot of lessons from what went on on Egypt and the actual delivery programme for getting the wires in the air, etc., is, is delivering exceptionally well. So SDA now, we're, we're really quite confident in where we're going. And as I say, again, we're, we're managing it to, to budget uh, as well as to the timescales that we've been, been set. So good progress in terms of SDA, which again, we're, we're very happy with, and it ties very much into what Ian, the, the Edinburgh Glasgow electrification. So for instance, to facilitate the 42 minutes, we do need to deliver uh, to December 18 up to Dunblane, and that facilitates getting everything out of the way and, uh, and allowing fast enough train interactions to facilitate that steady 42 minute service uh, in December 18. Thank you. We'll move on to the uh, next question, uh, John. Talk about some of the other projects, if I may, please. And uh, my colleague uh, Richard talked about the Cutty Sark uh, Bridge, uh, uh, another high-profile piece of good work, the Fintorn Viaduct, which I visited, tremendous piece of work there. And if I could commend the the work by everyone involved, contractors, all your, your own people, at Forest, which saw the station open there in October. And a, a really good example of the community engagement that went on there um, in all sorts of ways. Um, to come to a, a negative, though, I'm, I'm afraid, and that is the OR, our uh, annual efficiency and financial assessment of Network Rail, 2016-17. And I'll quote here, there was an £83 million deferral on the Highland Mainline project for the three years to 2016-17 due to reprofiling work to later years and delays in awarding contracts. Can you possibly give us an update on that, um, outbuilding the key milestones that you would see in that project and the ultimate delivery date, please? David, do you want to touch on this? Uh, Highland Mainline. Hi Highland Mainline has actually been quite an evolving um, project uh, in terms of that. I mean, it started off looking very much like an infrastructure programme. Um, now, uh, as part of the franchise uh, bidding process, TS were very keen to see if there was alternative solutions uh, that could come out in bringing, rather than just a traditional mindset of you know, putting more things in the ground and changing things there, was there a solution that, that lay with uh, rolling stock, for instance, to achieve improvements in journey times, etc. So out of that process, in fact, yes, um, an awful lot can be achieved through the, the high-speed trains that are being referred to. And actually, what started off as a big infrastructure programme is much more kind of 90% on the Highland Main Line, a signalling scheme now, um, which will facilitate um, greater capacity on that line. 
it will facilitate further benefits in journey time. It will benefit freight as well uh, in some of the things that are being done in the Highland Main Line with increased standards and speeds through stations, etc. But it has reduced in scope. So, for instance, when it started as a project with us about 117 million, it's now about 51 million. So, in fact, it represents very good value for money for the taxpayer in that what originally started as, as I say, an infrastructure focused scheme to achieve uh, journey time and capacity improvements on the Highway Main Line has actually become a, a, a better industry solution um, while still achieving these outcomes. So, um, in terms of deferment, it's very much a changed project in terms of the scope is how I would, I would describe it. And, I, and I'd actually say it was a success for the overall industry for getting a result at a better kind of value for money for the, for the taxpayer. Well, solutions that don't require money or infrastructure are good. I just wonder how, if you could comment on the key milestones and how that would impact, for instance, on the proposed hourly service. Um, well, I think we achieve, I'm not entirely sure exactly what all of the ORR is referred to in that, so it's hard for me to comment as regards that, I must admit. I've Will there be an hourly service between um, Inverness and the, and the Central Belt, Perth? Yeah. I believe yeah. so, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's unaffected by the comments about the different route that's been taken, which I presume is the, the improvements we're passing at, at Aviemore and the like. I think the, it's important to recognise that the timetable we offer to customers is a function of both the rolling stock and the infrastructure, <coughs> and clearly uh, as being in alliance with one another, the operator and the infrastructure working together, if we can deliver a customer benefit in a more efficient way, then clearly we'd be foolish not to take that opportunity because that's money that we can spend on other things. And of course, the creation of this intercity uh, network between the seven cities of Scotland is going to improve journey times, frequency, capacity, comfort. It's going to revolutionise uh, the service we offer to our customers on the longer distance routes. And in terms of a finalised timetable, that's still under development just now. So while I believe that aspiration will be met, the exact timetable is under development and I understand it will be, there'll be greater clarity on that in the first quarter of next year uh, as the timetabling work has been worked through. Um, so at that point, there'll be a much greater clarity about exactly what can run on the Highland Main Line. But I think that overall aspiration will still be met. And the view, sorry, just finally, if I may, the, the view that that particular line is at capacity just now, the proposed changes will be capable of increasing the capacity? Yes, the signalling will facilitate more. It will facilitate um, trains arriving at the same time at stations that they can just now, the extensions on loops, which again will, will give greater capacity for trains to pass. And that's, that's the real function on those lines. Okay, yep. Many thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mike, yours. Um, yes. I'd like to particularly want to focus on the North East. Uh, we've had previous discussions about this, but for the benefit of the committee, I mean, uh, could you provide an update on the delivery of the Aberdeen and Venice project uh, on that line and when you expect key milestones to be delivered, such as um, enhanced commuting into, say, Aberdeen and in, indeed in Venice, um, particularly from, from Inverurie to, to, to Aberdeen, and also when you think the Kintour station might be delivered? So, in big picture terms, we're spending £330 million upgrading the railway between Aberdeen and Inverness, and obviously we heard earlier on around the new station at Forest, which I was uh, very pleased to open uh, last month, brand new, fully accessible. Um, that work is clearly uh, at the west end of that route, and we now move to the east end of the route to increase track capacity. And what that is going to enable us to do is improve journey times between Aberdeen and Inverness, but also allow the introduction of more commuter-type services into Aberdeen and uh, into Inverness. And that's all due for completion in December 2019, but there is a gradual um, sort of progressive introduction of service enhancements as we deliver the infrastructure and as we have the trains to exploit the infrastructure. So I don't know, David, whether you've got any more detail we can share. Yeah, well, in the West, the West End, which obviously a lot of work's been done and people focus on the station, but we did, um, we re-signalled there to kind of modern state-of-the-art signalling. We shut level crossings, we upgraded level crossings. Uh, we did um, do some extensions as well in terms of loop, loop capacity. Um, 
the benefit for the customer, and that, that really comes as a, a kind of hourly service um, enhancement into Inverness, and that comes when uh, rolling stock is cascaded from the central belt, and that's what will facilitate that. Uh, at the other end, um, as Alex said, for December 19, that will be a half hourly peak service between Inverurie uh, and Aberdeen, which will make quite a significant difference. And at that point, also an hourly service between Aberdeen and Inverness. So that's quite kind of transformational against what people are seeing just now uh, up in, in that area. So some of the timing is um, infrastructure related. And as I say, actually to exploit the West End benefits which were built in just now, that's actually Fleet Cascade mm -hmm. um, that is the limiting factor just now, but that will be released from the, the kind of developments that are happening in the, in the Central Belt and the new fleet coming in. Right, I'm, I'm sure the half hour service in two years time in and out of Aberdeen will be very welcome to commuters. Um, and along that line, the, the Kintore railway station stop, uh, when do you think that will be ready, do you think? Um, well, there's the two new stations, Kintore, um, both Dalcross and Kintore are actually outside of the scope of the A2I project um, as it happens. However, um, we're expecting both stations to be built early CP6, so going into 2020 uh, is probably the best. We have recently been instructed by TS with regards to Dal Cross, uh, and the Contour um, land has just been compulsory purchase order going through. So we expect that then to be instructed. So the exact time scale, I can't advise you, but if everything is lining up now for that to take place. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next question, which is Rhoda. Thank you. Um, just some some questions about the performance figures. Um, the public performance measure for period seven was 88.3%, and that was lower than the same period last year. And I wonder why that is and what steps are being taken to improve performance. So clearly, punctuality and reliability <coughs> is at the top of our agenda. And the last time I appeared in front of the committee, our moving annual average for performance was 90.6 um, and at the end of last period it was 91.1 so we continue to move in the right direction and clearly the performance improvement plan is working. Uh, we're now the UK's most punctual large operator and other operators are all, all also seeing the benefits of improved reliability. So, for example, some of the punctuality which Caledonian Sleeper is delivering is the, uh, the best on record. Um, in terms of the period, um, we had uh, an early autumn. Autumn's come about a month earlier than it normally does. So you've seen more autumn impact in this period. And of course, autumn is a hugely challenging period for us operationally, which is why we're spending three million pounds on making sure we can operate the trains safely and reliably during autumn. But we also had a little bit of bad luck in the period. The single biggest incident that we experienced here in Scotland was actually the single biggest incident anywhere across the UK network where we had another operator's service um, uh, uh, go through a red light uh, in the Haymarket area which damaged a set of points which meant we lost the service for an entire day in the Edinburgh area and we also saw a, um, a some, some examples of cable uh, theft um, in the Fife area uh, on a disused branch line which affect the main line. Uh, we guarded that site in the short term and we've actually just signed off some infrastructure changes which will insulate the signalling system between this uh, disused freight branch and the main line. Um, so it was a combination of some uh, external factors plus uh, an earlier autumn. But of course, because we were a month earlier into autumn, we will exit autumn quicker. And as of today, 80% of the leaves down and we're looking forward to seeing the end of autumn so we can get back to the levels of performance which customers have enjoyed earlier on in the year. And so performance you hope will be better going forward than last year? Well, I, a lot of it is the timing of autumn. Clearly, the whole purpose of the performance improvement plan which has delivered this improvement is to make sure we continually improve performance and we're better than the same period last year. 
Um, because we've entered autumn earlier, we expect to leave autumn earlier so we can get back to the higher level of performance. But um, improving on last year's period is always the name of the game. That's what we try to do every single period. Just, just before we move off uh, this question, I've got a question from Jamie. Uh, it, it, have you got anything more on that before you move to your next one, Rhoda? No, nothing more on Can that. I bring Jamie in and, and then Fulton, maybe? Thank you, Convener. It's uh, very relevant to the is uh, issue around uh, the PPMs and, and how you, you approach hitting those targets. Uh, I don't know about any of the other members, but my inbox is full of complaints around continuous <coughs> uh, uh, stop-skipping or skip-stopping, depending who you ask. Um, it, it particularly affects uh, a, a, a whole number of stations in, in my part of the world, including uh, Cardross, uh, Eastern Bartonshire, um, some of the, the stations around the busy hubs around Glasgow. Um, I do understand the reasons for it, and, I've, and we've heard evidence on that previously in committee, but it really is a, an issue, especially when two consecutive services uh, are both uh, skipping stations. That is a particular concern of a number of constituents, and I just wondered how you might address that uh, or, or give some reassurances on that. Well, clearly we measure... Uh, every instance of skip stopping and that's something that we look at closely every single day you know there are twice daily performance calls happening for, across the scott rail alliance to manage the issue of performance um, you know contrary to popular belief we don't use skip stopping to massage the ppm figures if we skip stop it's actually a ppm failure we only use it in the circumstances where if we didn't use it then trains would actually run later. So we do it to reset the delivery of the timetable. And we do that on those bits of the network where the service pattern is so intensive that we don't have enough turnaround time at location. So we use it as sparingly as we can. Clearly, the aspiration has got to be to use it uh, as less as we possibly can. Um, in any railway, anywhere in the world, it will always be used as a mechanism to reset the timetable to timetable for the greater good. Um, from my perspective, perhaps in the past, it's been overused at the wrong time, so we try and avoid using it at peak times in the peak direction, but it is an inevitable um, uh, action we have to take, particularly on those intensive parts of the network, where often the headway between trains is you know, two and a half minutes. So we're doing anything we can to reduce it, but you know it remains a bugbear of our customers, which is why we're working so hard to fix it. C can you give any reassurances around uh, uh, it happening on two consecutive services, which is a particular bugbear of people? From my perspective, that is not welcome, uh, and clearly, uh, you know, we use it in the more frequent bits of the network so there is a service close behind if we use it on two consecutive then that kind of defeats the object and of course for customers who do experience a skip stop that is equivalent to a cancellation and that is nothing that uh, we aspire to deliver but as i would say we are managing down the use of this technique and we do do it for the overall delivery of a punctual and reliable service for scotland's yeah. railway thank you oh, <clears throat> Thanks, panel. Uh, my uh, supplementary just follows on from Rhoda Grant's line of questioning and your, your response, Alex. And there was a quite serious um, incident of cable theft somewhere between myself and John Mason's constituency. So I'm not sure exactly where it was in the line, but it was uh, somewhere between the two constituencies. Um, and I just wondered if you would be, given that you, you started to talk about that and the response to it, I wonder if you'd be able to um, just explain to the, the committee um, how you responded to that incident in order to keep people safe, because it was very serious and could have potentially been a lot worse. Well, I mean... And I look forward to your answer. Could I just remind everyone that, that it's quite time on the, tight on the time, so, uh, you know... <laughs> As full as you can make it, yeah. with, and okay. as concise. So, I, I, I appreciate, uh, Convener, that it's not a question that we looked at in, in the papers, however, not given that it was brought up, I think that it was a serious incident, and it could also explain some of the uh, reasons why the line was closed for that day as well, so it's based on that. 
Thanks, mm. So last period we had three days which were affected by cable theft. Um, and, you know, the, the, the rail industry has been extraordinarily successful at tackling the issue of cable theft. Uh, you know, we actually had a change in the law to uh, reduce the trading of scrap metal using cash. We deployed uh, additional uh, security, but also some innovative measures, such as smart water, where we actually mark uh, this cable so we can trace it after it's gone. And that has meant that the delays to trains as a result of cable theft have come down hugely. Uh, we saw this spike, you know, David and I discussed the first incident and said you know it's likely that they'll be back here and they they were and clearly guarding the site but then making the permanent changes to the signaling system in that area to reduce the likelihood of it happening again is um, you know at the top of our agenda but clearly when we're operating a network as large as Scotland's railway um, you know inevitably you know criminals do target uh, some uh, bits of our operation for personal gain and clearly making sure we provide a reliable service to customers means that that's one of the things we have to tackle. To that particular incident between Copebridge and Bailiston, um, that was a couple of months back. Uh, I don't personally recall that particular incident. Um, I'm thinking more of these three incidents that we suffered last period. Um, David, I don't know whether you can recall the detail around uh, If you want to respond to the committee in writing on that, yeah. um, so we can, we can consider how that particular instance was dealt with. I would like, though, to move back to Rhoda, because she has a few questions before we move on to the next section. Yes, um, moving to the moving annual average for right time arrivals. Um, that is now 52.3%, and maybe a little at odds with what you said earlier, it's 7.5% below the UK average. Um, why is that and what are we doing to increase right time arrival? The, re the reason why right time performance in Scotland is beneath the national average in terms of UK is because we're not targeting a right time railway. Um, you know, the, the, the contract we have with Scottish Government um, targets PPM, that is the primary driver of train service uh, performance, which is, did the train run and did it arrive within four minutes and 59 of its timetable arrival? And one of the reasons why Scottish Government isn't um, particularly um, uh, prioritising on time performance, time to the nearest minute, is because Scottish Government still has ambitions around improving journey time. Um, and so clearly, if we were to target on time on its own, we could be tempted to extend journey times. Actually, we don't want to extend journey times. We want to reduce them to make rail travel more competitive. And of course, the other thing about a railway which doesn't target on time uh, as much as PPM is it gives us a little bit more wiggle room as the operator to A, hold connections uh, for customers where that makes sense, but also to help customers on and off trains if they need a little bit more help. That's easier to do when we have a PPM target rather than on-time target. So uh, the reason why on-time is lower in Scotland than across the UK is because it's not the focus of our activity. So, I mean, as I said in, um, ahead of the session that I'm in, uh, uh, vice, uh, honorary vice president of the North Highland Line, that's a line that's seen journey times increase but actually um, performance decrease so um, that is an issue of concern but going by what you've said in answer to that we can't expect to see any improved performance in right time arrivals because well, you're not focused on customers that. can expect to see improvements in uh, ppm the public performance measure did the train run did it arrive within four minutes 59 of its scheduled arrival time and obviously the overall company performance has improved in recent times, uh, which we should celebrate. But what we're also seeing is a rise to the agenda of what I would call line of route issues. So perhaps some routes which are more challenging to operate, i.e. those with large lengths of single uh, line, uh, where performance is lower than the company average. And we need to attack those just as hard as we've attacked the overall company performance. 
Okay. Um, can I turn to um, Network Rail, um, which is responsible for over half of the Scott Rail delays? Um, what is happening to reduce this, and how much of that is attributable to infrastructure investment, or indeed the issues you talked about earlier about um, you know incidences and, and and theft of cable? So you know, in, in any railway in the world, infrastructure will be the primary cause of delay because of it impacts all rail services. Unlike a train failure, which just operates uh, impacts that service and its subsequent services. Um, and it's pleasing to see that the infrastructure of Scotland's railway is getting more reliable. Uh, we have an asset improvement programme. We're investing millions of pounds to make the performance impacting infrastructure more reliable. Uh, David oversees that investment programme. And compared to this time last year, the infrastructure in Scotland's railway is more reliable than it was. Yeah. Can I add to that? Just to put in a certain context, if you if you went back 10 years, say, so to 2006-07, you'd be looking at over 5,000 asset incidents in Scotland Railway every year. So if you went to 16-17, there's less than 3,000. So from more than 5,000 to less than 3,000 over 10 years it gives you a kind of scale of the improvement in asset performance. Last year to this year, so far we've seen an improvement of eight, over 8% 8 reduction in the number of incidents, which has been largely fed through from the investment in the asset improvement plan, uh, which we've talked about before here, which was very specifically to address some of the, the issues that we saw in the poorer uh, performing times that um, we saw over a year ago. So we've seen investment going in. Um, outside of that asset improvement plan, we're also looking to invest quite significant numbers more in the next year. So really ramping up in terms of some of our line size stuff, our drainage, our DVEG, which has been an issue traditionally uh, in Scotland, um, fencing, etc. So looking to invest even more than, than we'd set aside. We'd set aside £24 million over three years for the asset improvement plan, which is very focused at things, not just because of worn out, but because there might be better alternatives that are more reliable. So. We've got the 24 million which we'll spend, but we're also looking at significant other areas of spend that we can supplement that, and we are seeing that coming through. Uh, and you are right, uh, network rail accounts for about just over 50% of delays. Actually, some of that is network rail south of the border, uh, and what happens is you have an impact on trains which then come up into Scotland. So in terms of PPM failures, network rail Scotland's responsible for about 44%. Of, of PPM failures in Scotland and south of the border is responsible for about 5% of that. So it gives you a kind of scale for, for what happens within here. But we, we are absolutely committed to improving our asset performance. We're seeing that coming through in terms of the figures and I expect that to, to carry on uh, for the rest of the control period and into to control period six. Um, the next question is Peter. Guys, can you provide an update on preparations for the introduction of high-speed trains on the Central Belt to Aberdeen and Central Belt to Inverness routes? Yep. Absolutely. I'm keen to bring Angus in, but before I do, uh, the first driver training unit is in Scotland. We're training the drivers at Aberdeen. We've taken on 20% more drivers at that depot, so already providing uh, benefits to the local economy. And in May, we introduced the first intercity service um, between Aberdeen and the Central Belt, which will mark the start of this transformation of the intercity network for Scotland. There's an enormous amount of work happening behind the scenes, which Angus and his colleagues are overseeing, so I'll pass on to you, Angus, to give a more detailed update. Yes, so the, uh, the introduction of the high-speed trains is going well. Um, we've, as Alex said, we've got the first driver training train operating between Aberdeen and Inverness. That's going exceptionally well. Um, We've got our power cars and our first rolling stock, actually the coaches that our, our customers will sit in, are in refurbishment as per the plan. And we start seeing delivery of further uh, high-speed trains in February next year with the aim of having a timetable change, which puts the first four of the uh, high-speed trains in service in May next year. So it's uh, all looking good. And um, you know I'm looking forward to coming into uh, the ScotRail network. It's, they're going to be fabulous. Uh, and I think our customers will really value them. What's this going to do to, to journey times on these routes? It's going to improve the journey times um, on these routes. Um, between, and earlier was mentioned about the hourly between uh, Inverness and Perth. That will be an improvement in the journey time. There, we've got the driver training um, train going about in the, the far north at the moment, as I explained. 
um, you know, we're seeing some good figures from how that train is performing, how it's accelerating, how it's uh, handling the infrastructure. So that gives us a more informed position about how we can best utilise this investment uh, to uh, further improve the, uh, our timetabling and uh, what we offer our customers. Okay. Bring in John briefly, if I may. Conscious of time, uh, convener, I, I've engaged out with committee with Mr. Hines on this, and, and I'll continue that. But it, it's about the issue of bikes and trains, and, and an expectation that was um, mainly brought about by, by this slide presentation here, which says, and I quote, "Class one two fives will have capacity of at least 20 cycles." Now, I appreciate that there are different types of trains, and I've got lots of information about toilets and tanks and braking systems and an engine car. But can you just comment in general terms, Mr Hines, about the, the, uh, or indeed Mr Tom, about the cycle capacity? Because we do talk about integrated transport and if we're wanting to, to encourage that, uh, we must maximise the capacity of our cycles and trains. Yeah, absolutely. So we recognise that there's a strong customer appetite for taking bikes on the trains. And obviously in an environment where uh, we don't have enough trains, we inevitably end up compromising on the service we provide to all our customers, including those we cycle. So, um, you know, our charter says we guarantee the carriage of two bikes on each train. We recognize that in some cases we can deliver more. Uh, we don't promise that because having got you there, you might be a different type of train and we might struggle to get you back. So um, we're improving... Almost 20 on the 125. By, I'll come on to that in a minute. So all the trains we operate will be fully accessible by December 2019, which means they have these uh, easy access areas, tip-up seats. It creates more space for, for bikes and indeed uh, buggies and wheelchairs as well. So that will be an improvement for customers. And we are currently um, uh, seeing what's feasible around the HSTs. And in fact, we're having a conversation with Scottish Government as we speak to see how we can utilise the guards vans, if that's possible, on the high-speed trains for the carriage of bikes. There are some, uh, a number of practical issues which we need to address. So, for example, uh, because these trains will be longer, sometimes the power car might be off the end of the platform, so we need a, a way around that. Uh, and the other thing is that these guard vans um, have big, heavy doors, which are very difficult for staff and customers to uh, operate. So we're seeing what's possible and we're in active discussions with Transport Scotland to see how we can meet this demand. My view is that particularly on those intercity services, uh, you know, I think passenger numbers are going to grow very significantly once we improve the service starting in May. I think the demand's out there. We need to see whether we can accommodate it. Okay, many thanks indeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There, there, were, a, there were a couple of questions that we had hoped to get in that Fulton McGregor was going to ask. Unfortunately, due to timings, we're going to submit those as written questions post uh, the uh, meeting. And I would ask if it's possible that you could respond to them promptly uh, so I can circulate them round to members. I apologise uh, to you, Mr McGregor, for that, but uh, we are short of time. And I'd like to move on to John Mason, if I may, please. Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, some time ago there was the suggestion that uh, huge profits were flowing from Scotland to the Netherlands, and uh, then more recently there's been press reports that in fact uh, it was going the other way, and that ScotRail was having, or Belial ScotRail was having to be bailed out, lent money, whatever, uh, from the other end. So could you give us a wee bit of clarity on any of that, the financial position? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, Abellio Scott Rail is in a strong financial position. Uh, it made a profit in the first nine months of its operation, and I would hasten to say Abellio Scott Rail has never paid a dividend to its parent company. So, um, any reports you see of uh, large profits being made and repatriated to the parent company are just not true. Um, recent trading has not been as strong as we would like, which is one reason why the finances have been weaker. And clearly one of my jobs is to get the business back into the black and the improvements that we will deliver next year for customers will grow revenue significantly. And that's, that's the reason why we're trading uh, less well than we expected. It's a revenue issue rather than a cost issue. And I'm looking forward to delivering those uh, enhancements to customers 
next year, not just to create happy customers, but also to drive the revenue, which ultimately taxpayers benefit from, because obviously it's Scottish government which owns the franchise, not, not me. We're just the short-term stewards of it. And if we can get higher revenue, that ultimately results in lower subsidy to the Scottish taxpayer. I mean, I mean, you've told us already that, you know, there's some quite dramatic uh, increases in your capacity. I think, uh, is it 20% um, more drivers, did you say? 25% more coaches, 45% more seat journeys. I mean, clearly there's a risk that if people don't actually use these, your revenue would be under pressure. How confident are you that people will use them? Well, what we've seen is where we've added new services and more capacity, we've seen the growth. And a lot of the issues that we face are the problems of growth. You know, the reason why the trains are crowded is because people want to use them, which is why we're investing in 25% more carriages. So I'm absolutely convinced that the market is there once we get the capacity and the quality of the product right. And clearly it's for us to make sure, having provided 45% more seats, uh, we've got some great offers for customers to make sure they're filled. I mean, are you expecting a, a, a big jump as you bring out all the new trains, there'll be a big jump in passengers, or will it build up gradually? Have you got a plan for that? Well, there's always a ramp up. We, you know, we assume a ramp up, but it's our job to use marketing to accelerate that ramp up. And we've got a really exciting launch campaign planned for next year, both for the new trains on Edinburgh Glasgow and also the intercity network to stimulate that demand. People need to know that that product is there uh, and that it's great. Clearly, we want existing rail customers to use rail more frequently, but also there's a big untapped market there of people who don't currently use rail. We, went, we want them on Scotland's railway as well. Thank you. Uh, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Um, in the interest of time, I'll keep these questions very specific and, and very brief. I think it's important we look at the issue of uh, the rail funding uh, in Scotland, which has been extensively covered in the media in, in, the, in, in the last few weeks. Um, the first question is, uh, Mr Hines, can you give me your numerical understanding of the funding for control period six and how that compares to control period five? Well, um, Scottish Government has published its high-level output specifications, so we know what it is Scottish Government uh, want to buy. We don't yet know what funds are available from Scottish Government because there's a live negotiation happening between Westminster and Holyrood, and I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment on that live negotiation, but we're looking forward to being in receipt of the statement of funds available from Scottish Government as soon as possible. Uh, secondly, uh, there seems to be some anomaly in the figures around what, how much money is actually required over the next control period. The ORR uh, gave a figure of 1.9 billion. We've heard a figure of 4.2 billion from the Scottish Government. There's a huge disparity in those numbers. Do you have any views on how much money will be required over the next control period to ensure this continuing safety and performance of Scottish Railway? So, um, the, the way the rail network is funded uh, is split down between the operations, maintenance and renewal of the network and the enhancements of the network. And obviously, uh, there's more network to maintain and renew and there's more rail traffic on the infrastructure. And therefore, Network Rail has successfully argued that in order to maintain high levels of safety and performance, we need to spend more money on operations, maintenance and renewal. As I understand it, the issue of debate is how much money there is available for enhancements and that's what's currently being discussed between um, the UK and the Scottish Government. So um, we've, we've got more than enough money to maintain uh, a safe and reliable network. The issue here is how much available uh, there is in the next control period, so 2019 to 2024, for enhancements and that's the live negotiation uh, I talked about a few moments ago. Okay, so it's your understanding that there, there, the proposal is, is that there will be enough money for the, uh, the required uh, maintenance of Scotland's tracks and any uh, argument is around how much additional money will be given for additional upgrades. Is that your understanding? I mean, yeah. Okay, thank you. And the third and final quick question, uh, convener, is... Sorry. No, I'm sorry. You, you, you have had your three questions and I'm going to have to... Uh, Due to timing, it's going to move to the final question. Could ask for a response in writing then? Uh, yes, we'll take a response in writing. You may pose the question, and I'd ask Mr. Hines maybe to respond in writing. 
if, if Member Steins could confirm uh, how much uh, the funding is made available per passenger in Scotland, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So the final question is, is, is my question, is, is that money was taken out of the Square Fund uh, this year to uh, subsidise uh, rail travel. Could you give me an indication of how much money is in the Square Fund? And as you are the person that will put ideas forward on how it's spent, have you submitted ideas to the government? And if not, will you be submitting them by the end of February? So we continually... Uh, propose ideas to government um, because there's always money available in this fund. Um, obviously in September we launched our free ticket giveaway. Within 24 hours we gave 40,000 return tickets away a value of over a million and we're proposing to uh, launch a similar type promotion for customers uh, early in the new year. Uh, meanwhile uh, given the existence of these funds, we're also seeing what we can do to improve, for example, the station experience on those routes which are going to experience new trains. I'm keen not just to introduce new trains. I want to launch the product, relaunch the product, and that includes the station experience. So we're currently talking to Transport Scotland about how we use some of that Squire fund for station enhancements on those bits of the network which will benefit from new trains. My understanding is that the Squire fund is, it should be used for improving the experience and access and use of stations, not necessarily in ticket giveaways. Uh, is, is that the way you are proposing to do it now that you are the person who can influence how it's spent? I think we're keen to invest uh, that money in um, capital projects which improve the customer experience for um, you know, a sustained period of time. That's, that's our preference. And just to conclude that, could I ask you to perhaps let the committee have a list of ideas that you've come up with and submitted to Transport Scotland for the use of the Square Fund? And at that stage, I'm afraid we have run out of time. I would like to thank uh, all of you for, for attending the committee and giving evidence. There are one or two matters that you have undertaken to respond to the committee on, and there are some questions that, unfortunately, we, we were unable to pose to you, but the clerks will make sure that those are... Uh, sent to you shortly. So thank you. I'm briefly going to suspend the meeting. No, I'm not. I'm going to move the meeting into private session and at the same time allow the witnesses uh, to depart. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.